So I've hit meeting in progress. So perhaps that was the. <sighs> testing. It's. <laughs> okay. I've seen. I'm at you. So I can see the YouTube stream has started, but I can't hear myself. I can't hear anything. So I'm, I must be doing something. Okay, I'm testing the sound. And I'm still, Gabby, I can't get into the cities on the cities page. Lorraine, I was listening to the city page for you, and I didn't have any sound through that. Okay, it is working. Thanks, Stephanie. I just, right. Okay, so presentation laptop, testing presentation laptop. Yeah, it's it's the delay is quite long. We know that it feels like an eternity. Stephanie, when you were talking to me, you were talking to me through WebEx. Is that right? Hi, Lorraine. Yes, sorry, because I had okay. been listening to okay. the website for you. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. Am I coming through the city website, Gabby? Did I come through the city website? Okay. Okay, I think we should be fine.
9.30, we have quorum and we're good to go. So uh, welcome everyone to our meeting uh, of council this September the 16th. And um, I wish you all a good morning and remind you that the city of Hamilton is situated upon the tr traditional territory, the Huron, Erie ne Neutral, Hurawandot, Haudenosaunee and Mississauga. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792, between the Crown and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. And today the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America. <clears throat> and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. <laughs> Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live at the city of Hamilton, our temporary archi are archived on our city's website. And a reminder that uh, all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during council Thanks, meetings. Mark. And Looks I perfect. will go to roll call and I will ask for those that are present, Councillor Wilson. I see you, thank you. Councillor Farr. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Councillor Nan. Good morning, present. Good morning, thank you. Councillor Marula. Present. Good morning. Councillor Col Collins, good morning. Fred. Present. Good morning. Councillor Jackson. Here. <laughs> we'll let that settle in for a minute. <laughs> Councillor Pauls. I am here. Uh, <laughs> wow. I am too. Councillor Danko. Present. Councillor Partridge. Not as yet. Councillor Whitehead. Top of the morning to you. Top of the morning to you, lad. Uh, Councillor Vanderbeek. I see you. Councillor, can't hear you yet, unfortunately. Councillor Vanderbeek, uh, yes, you're here. Councillor Ferguson. Present. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Pearson. Good morning, present. Thank you. And Councillor Clark. Good morning, sir. And I now see Councillor Partridge. Morning. Good morning. All right, the approval of the agenda. Madam Clerk, are there uh, any changes to the agenda, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor, good morning. There are 23 added communication items. We have 410, which is 15 pieces of correspondence respecting the reduction of Aberdeen Avenue from four lanes to two lanes, with a recommendation to be received and referred to the General Manager of Public Works for appropriate action. For 417, we have six pieces of correspondence respecting the temporary emergency shelter with a recommendation to be received. We have 418, which is correspondence from the Honorable Stephen Clark Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing respecting the Federal Provincial Safe Restart Program agreement, and that is to be received. We have 419 with correspondence from Bridget Marsden respecting encampments in Hamilton with a recommendation to be received. There are three added notices of motion. 7.1 is a demolition permit for 832 Barton Street, Stony Creek. That item is being withdrawn to be and is to be considered at the September 22nd Planning Committee. We have item 7.2, Federation of Canadian Municipalities with, a, with concerning the election to the Board of Directors. We have 7.3, which is proactive community information and solutions regarding Metrolink's demolition on King Street East in Ward 3. There are three added bills. We have bill number 20197, being a bylaw to permanently close a portion of an unassumed alley abutting 11 Avalon Place. We have bill number 20198, being a bylaw to permanently close a portion of unassumed alley abutting 13 Avalon Place, and bylaw 2199, being a bylaw to permanently close a portion of road allowance abutting 600 Fifth Concession Road West in Flamborough. That is everything. Okay, thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Moved by Pearson, seconded by Councilor Paulus. <laughs> thank you. Any speakers to that? Councilor Whitehead. Um, first of all, I didn't know when you want me to deal with the other issue, but uh, on Aberdeen, um, I have two choices. I can pull from the minutes of the public works, or I can uh, speak to it in the context of the letters that are before us. What would the uh, chair um, advise? Uh, there are a number of communications that are uh, on the communications items. If you want to speak to those communications items, that's probably the appropriate location. 
Okay, but I was going to get into the substance of the conversation without, there's no motion. See, I got, I can pull it from the minutes and have the conversation or I can talk about it now. I'm, I'm looking to your guidance. Well, I, I just gave it to you. So okay. I, I think uh, the appropriate step would be to deal with the communications items. That's where it's raised. This is not on the agenda other than a bylaw. So uh, you can raise it through communications. Uh, that's your option. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, I, uh, this uh, deeply impacts my uh, award, so I okay, need to- Okay, well, this is not the time, though. So we're not at communications yet. Okay, thank you. So I'll you call on you when, so you can call the item out on the communications and then you can uh, discuss it then. Fair enough. I will come to you as soon as we approve the agenda. So I'm gonna ask for a vote on the agenda as amended. Uh, mover was Councillor, sorry, Councillor Partridge wants to speak. No, 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 I'm okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the mover was Councillor Pearson and Councillor Pauls, as I recall. Okay, we're waiting for the vote to uh, be finalized. That's approved. Thank you. And Councillor Whitehead, you wanted to speak to the Mr. Uh, the passing of Mr. Perry. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council and uh, community. Uh, Tony Perry uh, was an individual that was larger than life. He was my he was my Danny DeVito. Uh, he um, was involved in, in so many things. He was uh, he uh, lived in Ward Three for many years. Uh, became a Ward Three trustee for the Catholic School Board. Uh, he sat on many committees for the City of Hampton over the many years. He, he even has uh, his son in laws and that involved with the city. On, in community aspects. Him and Claudette uh, uh, also were in the DJ business, and well, I should say he was. But Claudette would accompany him as a beautiful wife. Uh, they were a real team, and uh, often uh, you would hear them singing, uh, uh, joining in the songs uh, during weddings or parties or, or whatever. Uh, he became a recent uh, uh, Ward 14 uh, resident, I should say Ward 8. Before that, he moved from Ward 3 to uh, Lloyd Ferguson's ward in Scenic Woods. Now he moved as uh, he's my neighbor here in, uh, in the Fastlane neighborhood. So I tell you, he uh, he's going to be missed because he was larger than life. Uh, he always brought joy to the room. Um, he was a friend. He was a hard worker. He had a lot to say. He wasn't short of opinion. He was an actor. Um, he was well loved. Uh, there was a group of uh, uh, men that uh, would go to Tim Hortons over in. Um, Magnolia, since COVID, though, they started going to the uh, Meadowlands and they bring their lawn chairs and they respect the social separation and get their coffees and sit down and have a chat. There'd be about 10 of them. Uh, I would join them periodically around 7, 7 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, he was a real joy to listen to uh, and stories and so many stories he can tell. He was a family man. Uh, he was often seen with his grandchildren and uh, taking care of them and with soccer games. Uh, participating in uh, in many of the sports with his children as, as well as he could. He was a chef. Uh, he was probably one of the most incredible chefs I've ever met. Uh, and he was probably great, one of the great, most wonderful hosts, him and Claudette, that you could have. He will be sadly missed, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my heart and prayers are with uh, Claudette and the family. Uh, I know he's have a, he has a visitation tonight and then uh, the funeral is tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and yes, we uh, we'll collectively pass on our condolences to the family. Uh, gone too soon, and certainly, uh, you know, a great, uh, great character in our community that uh, we uh, we will miss for sure. Thank you, Councillor, for that nice uh, eulogy. And uh, I'm not going to ask for uh, declarations of interest from members of Council or any, any declarations of interest relative to any items on the agenda. Not seeing any members of Council, there are. Uh, we have the minutes of August the 21st and the minutes of the special council meeting on September the 10th. We can do them together or separately, whatever your preference is. Who would like to move uh, that both minutes at the same time? Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Pearson, thank you. Any other questions on the minutes? If not, we'll go to a vote electronically. Councillor. 
Okay, thank you. All approved on the communications. Councilor Johnson, may I have a motion on the communications items, please, to get it on the floor? Councilor yes, you Johnson. may. Uh, it has been moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Marula that the September 16th, 2020 council communications be approved and as presented. And um, if, if there are any changes, it would be as amended. All right, thank you. On the communications items, there are a number of them. Uh, Councilor Whitehead, you indicated you wanted to speak or have interest in speaking to some of the communications items relative to Everdeen. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Hart, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I, I will not be pulling out of the uh, minutes of the public works. I, I'll, I'll do it all, the whole thing now. Um, Aberdeen uh, is a, uh, a road, uh, an arterial road. It was designed, um, it's the only uh, arterial road, or one of the very few that's connecting uh, only the five axes. So please understand, there's only five axes in the city of Hamilton, mountain axes. Aberdeen joins two of them. Uh, it joins the 403 highway, series highways, uh, to the Queen Street. So out of five uh, connections, Aberdeen serves to connect two. It also has the uh, Shadow Golf Course as a destination location, and it's also a major driver to employment. Uh, so when people are going west to the hospital, uh, health sciences, or the Wohlhoff College, or Hillfield on the Mountain, it's a major connection between employment lands. Uh, th this uh, four-lane road has been uh, uh, troublesome in the context of the local uh, neighborhood uh, in, in, uh, for safety. And uh, for years, last four, five, three, four years, our traffic uh, division has done an incredible job. Uh, they address many of the intersection issues. Uh, the road is actually ranked on a safety audit 525. So that means it's, it's not number one, number two, but 525th. Uh, road in the context of uh, safety. The uh, a lot of work has been done on the on the road. Um, Aiden Johnson, Jason Farr, myself uh, worked on Queen Street conversion and uh, Aberdeen uh, issues. Uh, back in the, uh, eight, about eight months previous to the report, this report coming forward, uh, staff recommended not to put Aberdeen on a road diet. Um, now, they didn't try to test the, the will of council and brought a motion and the council said no. Uh, the outstanding list, the report actually said uh, for staff to monitor the changes they made on the road. So lo and behold, you can understand my surprise, eight months later, new council, where uh, a, a recommendation is coming forward with a zero consultation to recommend uh, shutting down two lanes in Aberdeen. And uh, certainly for my community, now, my experience in my community, Mr. Mayor, is, 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 is this. Uh, Gar Street uh, ramp and the Gulf Link ramp off the Lincoln Alexander, the last two ramps before the 403. When there's an accident or any problems on the 403, the, the last point of exit is Gar Street and Gulf Links Road. That draws all the traffic, Mr. Mayor, down Scenic, down uh, Gar Street, and it jams even West Fifth. So now you have West Fifth Hill, Queen Street Hill uh, jammed, but it's not that it's just jammed. We have over a mile or a kilometer of uh, uh, cars queuing on scenic and all the side streets. Uh, Guard Street, you'll have queuing all the way up to the ramp. That's four lanes of traffic. So people are pinned in their driveways. That's the experience of my residents now. So now reducing the lanes on uh, Queen Street is very concerning for my community. They were involved in the, the uh, consultations. They thought this was put to bed. And we were completely blindsided by the new director of traffic uh, to bring this recommendation forward when he, in fact, he did not have any city direction, no council direction, and that issue was already dealt with in the previous council. I would assume that he would need direction to move forward, but that's another debate. The issue is my committee may be impacted to a greater degree, and no one should make changes anywhere that impacts another ward. And I think the good councillor said one time, you always got to worry about upstream. Well, I can tell you any impacts on Aberdeen downstream has a significant impact upstream. So, Mr. Chair, I um, know that this is going to be, is going to be monitored uh, for six months. I want to thank my uh, council colleagues because there's been a lot of conversations and there's a lot of people that are looking at this very skeptically. My only caveat is we are in a, a post-COVID period. We have the advantage and the pleasure of having lighter traffic as a result of that. We're not at the pre-COVID traffic levels. 
So I hope that during the pilot, that is a consideration, Mr. Mayor, because that will skew the results. I certainly don't want a, a, a challenge where the worst scenario happens at a time where it's approved uh, based on a false uh, um, pilot program. So that's the, the caveat I'm going to tell my community that will allow the pilot to go forward, even though I had the votes to turn it down. I think it's prudent uh, that we allow it to go forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's within the five minutes. Uh, any other any speakers on this item? Councillor Wilson. Councillor Farr, I see you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, go ahead. Can't uh, can't hear you as yet, uh, Councillor. Seems to be a consistent problem there. So just unplug and use your uh, use your laptop mic. There we go. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just like to thank all the letter writers for their engagement um, and encourage an ongoing dialogue uh, with the city and, of course, with with me in the Ward One office. Um, and we'll be monitoring the changes uh, very closely. So uh, again, thank you everyone for your engagement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councillor Farr on this one. Go yes, ahead. Mr. Mayor, so uh, to be to be clear to uh, those residents who are probably watching right now, there is no reconsideration uh, motion coming. We heard um, one of our speakers suggest that they won't be pulling the public works report or that item. And so uh, we're sort of speaking to it now. And I just want to say uh, very briefly that I too appreciated all the input. It came to me in vast quantities over uh, the last six weeks, especially it uh, was a bit one sided for quite some time since public works. It's sort of evened out uh, one sided to the point of that uh, support for the petition. And with that, um, I've done a few things since that. That uh, public works wing dinger where one counselor was muted twice and another was ejected. It was a three and a half hour debate or so, another long one. And obviously that's not going to be the uh, situation here, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, today at council. But uh, I, I received some poll results. I was petitioning a particular block on a whether or not they wanted a speed cushion. So I threw this question in because the timing worked. Only one on this particular South Duran block was supportive of what's before us currently, what council approved and what I approve, as they know. Um, uh, and then I started hearing from others in South Duran. So this is not a cut and dry issue. I appreciate the point made by Councillor Whitehead about the fact that we are dealing with, and we discussed this, Ed Soldo brought it up, uh, very limited traffic volumes compared to um, you know what we traditionally see. I was on Garth this morning in peak hours. There was nobody you know waiting in queue to get out of their driveways. Uh, it's a considerable uh, reduction, and so we need to understand that if uh, the pilot results come back in six months, that everything's free flowing, like I've witnessed on Aberdeen on three occasions as well since the public works meeting during peak morning rush. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but we have to take that into consideration. Along with, as Edward Soldo mentioned, Mr. Mayor, final point that King Street is not in the mix yet and will be. Uh, Queen Street's two-way is uh, clearly being utilized. I, I'm on it quite often, and it's great to see people now focusing their attention on heading as north as they can, but it's only to turn east at this point. Anyway, thank you. It was quite a debate, there, there, and it's something I'm familiar with. The passion when it comes to complete streets uh, is, is palpable on both sides of the issue. It always has been, probably always will be, but for those many over the last six weeks, particularly from South Duran, but other areas who have appealed to me to take, uh, this petition into consideration, who with their years and decades of experience living and traveling that route had serious issue. What's before us. I I'm at the point of sticking with that support and certainly continuing to dialogue with everyone involved, uh, and, and study closely this, this particular pilot project. So thanks to everyone on this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others on this topic? Councillor Clark, and then, so let me see. Uh, sorry, I had Councillor Partridge first, and then Councillor Clark. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did hit the speaker button quite some time ago. Did I show up on the No, no, you're, uh, you're on the list. I, I just wasn't sure if you were on the list for this item for or for other items. It, oh, thank it, you. It doesn't yes. discriminate, so you're up first. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Well, I also want to speak to 4.4, .4, but um, I just want to recognize uh, those who completed a petition. Um, I believe there was over 700 uh, signatures, and, and I, it's important for us to recognize, you know, those who engage in uh, championing for their 
community regardless of what side of the issue they're on and 700 is not a small number. So I just want to recognize uh, the residents for doing that. I thank you for your engagement. I encourage everyone to stay engaged no matter what the issue is across our city because we, you know, it, it is important to, uh, to, to listen to everyone. Um, I also want to make sure though that, you know, the cut through traffic is going to happen. It is happening in my community. So I'm speaking from experience. Uh, um, I have no problem with letting this pilot go through, but uh, I do hope that we really take a serious look. I mean, COVID's on right now, so there may not be a lot of traffic. Kids are heading back to school. Um, so I'm, you know, I just wanna make sure that our traffic department and, um, and, and all of us pay attention to the issues that may arise. They will arise, it's just a question of when. With cut through traffic, uh, there's a lot of one-way streets in, in that area of Ward 1. And um, you know, especially I think of Homewood Avenue. And uh, yeah, so I, we just really need to pay attention to that. But I wanna thank all the residents for, uh, for participating. Thank you. And I'll be on 4.4 okay. too. Okay, I'll come back to you on that. Uh, on this one again, Councillor Nana, are you on this topic? No, okay. Um, Councillor Jackson on this topic? Yes, go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I also wanna, if you'd keep me on your list for 4.5 as well afterwards, please. Yeah, so let's let's just finish with this issue and then yes. I'll come back to you because it's, uh, you know, poor Lauren here is not knowing how, what, what order to keep them all in because everyone's asking for another item. So let's finish this one and then I'll ask for, uh, you know, additional uh, items uh, and, and you can de delegate at that point. Councillor Jackson, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, um, I just want to say that uh, June of 2019, um, there was a desire within Ward 1 to move ahead um, as quickly as possible permanently was my interpretation of a, of a lane reduction on Aberdeen. I was opposed to that. Um, working out during that debate in the late June meeting in the chambers, uh, Mr. Mayor, you were the one who um, came up with the thought and the idea of a possible compromise. Councillor Whitehead, to his tremendous credit, in fact, he was quoted in uh, the Andrew Dreschel column thereafter in saying to council, even though he would never support the uh, lane reduction and thought it was a flawed plan, to his credit, uh, Mr. Mayor, he said, council, if it's your majority desire to do this, for goodness sakes, at least make it a pilot program and most definitely make it conditional upon the Queen Street two-way con conversion all the way to King Street, but at least to Main Street last year, and Director Soldo has told us he is contractor, Mr. Mayor, would love to finish to King Street, but apparently there's some building development in Councillor Farr's ward near the end of King and Queen that unfortunately is logistically causing some structural issues that Director Soldo cannot finish the Queen Street two-way conversion to King, but it is on the books to be completed hopefully as soon as possible. So Mr. Mayor, last June, it was my amendment, seconded by Councillor Pauls, with that stipulation of the Queen conversion coming ahead of the pilot project for Aberdeen that I was supportive, and I continue to be supportive of that today. However, I wanna say, Mr. Mayor, that in my years on council, pre and post amalgamation, city and regional, there's very few members of council I've worked with that have been as ferocious and fierce in fighting for their constituents as Councillor Whitehead has been. And I've noticed, unfortunately, some of the unfair and unnecessary criticisms and attacks and at times mock, mocking remarks that he has had to endure because he was fighting for what he felt the overwhelming majority of the West Mountain, don't forget, for 15 years he represented 60,000 people in the entire West Mountain, from Upper James right over to the Ancaster border, that he felt with his finger on the pulse, this was gonna cause major issues, congestion, backlash, and he felt the overall plan was flawed. I just want to, because I don't think it's been done properly or often enough, I just want to admire and recognize him for he has consistently stood on his principles saying, please do not make this a site specific issue to be dealt with just within the Ward 1 area, even though geographically Aberdeen, west of Queen, is in Ward 1. 
because there are domino effects, especially from the mountain commuters that are gonna be impacted. And so to this very day, he has graciously said, all right, let this pilot go ahead, but he's also put a qualifier on it that I hope Director Soldo is very keenly listening to, that right now we're still coming out of COVID, but if it was pre-COVID time, the numbers may show something drastically different. Anyways, Mr. Mayor, I just needed on a personal and political level to say that about Councillor Whitehead, and he may, like I was 10 years ago when people told me to get on with it, Tom, about the one bag garbage limit. It was the right thing to do for the environment. And the lone wolf here kept shouting out, I think we're gonna have an increased illegal dumping problem. And not to brag, but sure enough, a couple of years later, I was proven we had an increased illegal dumping problem to the tune of a million bucks a year. Councillor Whitehead may still be proven right. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark on this topic. Can't hear you just yet, there we go. Should be good. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge Council Whitehead's um, acquiescence and pragmatism to allow the uh, pilot to go forward. Um, I, he had, was very clearly advocating strongly for his, his residents and he had indicated he was gonna go in one direction um, and then he's listened to a lot of people and come to the realization that let's let the pilot happen and see what the results of the pilot are, which I think is is very prudent. Uh, Mr. Mayor, is Mr. Soldis present in the council meeting? Soldo, I'm not sure, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I know Dan McKinnon is. Um, I'll ask Dan the question and if I don't have, if we don't have an answer, I can always get it offline. Okay. So my concern about the six month pilot is um, a, the COVID impact on traffic, so it's reduced the traffic dramatically right now, which is going to impact the numbers. Um, I'm not sure whether or not the traffic patterns that have changed as a result of COVID have been normalized, and we would expect that they will stay that way in the future. And normally, um, like the Ministry of Transportation looks at six months worth of traffic pattern, and then they can say, okay, that's now normalized. So how do we deal with the pilot if the numbers are down because of COVID? Dan? Traffic volume specifically, I think, which is I think Councilor Whitehead was trying to get to in his earlier comment. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councilor Clark. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. That will have an impact on the pilot. Uh, one of the things that uh, Edward and his team can do is when they come back, they can uh, try to, um, I guess, quantify or normalize the context uh, in which we are doing the pilot so that council can have a sense of what it may look like under normal conditions. Um, and then at that time, council can decide whether or not to extend it or, or if they feel they've got enough information uh, to make a judgment call one way or the other, whether or not it should uh, remain. And I guess that would be similarly, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the situation with the Queen Street conversion to, to King, because that's not going to happen during the six months, as I understand it. And that'll have a dramatic change on, on traffic patterns once that's complete. Dan? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, that, that's correct. Um, and, and again, it'll be in council's hands at the time, whether or not they want to direct us to extend the length of the pilot or if uh, whatever modeling we are able to do in consideration of COVID uh, provides the kind of clarity that uh, gives council the comfort to make a decision one way or the other. And I'm fine with that, Mr. McKinnon, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to give the heads up in advance so that we're paying attention when the pilot results come back, that there are two issues that may have impacted the volume numbers on that, on that pilot. But other than that, I'm uh, pleased to support moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, on this topic, Councillor Ferguson. Yes, Mr. Mayor, and thank you. Uh, I would just like to also go on the record that I opposed this from the start because it is an arterial road feeding in off Aberdeen Avenue. And a lot of my constituents uh, go to the uh, uh, southern part of the city, the lower city to do business, particularly to St. Joe's Hospital. And so whether you're an employee or a patient, traveling by personal car by EMS. This is gonna slow down that time for them to be able to get into the emergency room at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. 
I may not have been as passionate about this or as aggressive about this as uh, Councillor Whitehead was, but I've certainly been steeply opposed to it because arterial roads are meant for the entire city, not just for one particular area. Um, I too agree that uh, traffic is way down. I'll give you an example. I used to come down to city hall almost every day. As you know, we were in the council chambers and it would take me between 30 and 45 minutes. Yesterday, I come down at uh, 8.30 and um, I was there in, uh, to get, I was able to get inside the door at City Hall within 15 minutes of leaving my home. So it's wonderful right now on the 403, we don't get the congestion that we typically do, but you won't get a true reading in six months. I don't think it'll be back to the level it was before. So I'm disappointed we're not reconsidering this, but uh, I accept the will or the wishes of the majority and uh, we'll see how it goes. But I wanted to make those two points. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so first time speakers on this item. Anybody? Okay. Um, now I'm going to go to other items. Well, <laughs> okay. I'm going to put myself on the speakers list then. I want to thank all the, uh, all the participants that, uh, that uh, voiced their opinions on this issue. Uh, the one point I'd like to make is that this decision was made before COVID. And so some of the traffic, uh, you know, estimates that were actually uh, defined, uh, you know, how this pilot should go and why it should go was actually done pre-COVID. Uh, all the traffic numbers were pre-COVID numbers. So I think if we're going to, you know, factor in the COVID numbers, we also should factor in the pre-COVID numbers as a, as a result of the original recommendation that was made prior to COVID happening and all the, the uh, you know, the, the decision that we made relative to the compromise, which was, Yes, we can uh, do the pilot, but only until Queen Street has is, uh, is gone two-way. That was well before COVID started. And so I, I take your point on the COVID impacts. Uh, you know, let's also bear in mind the uh, pre-COVID impacts that uh, did traffic counts that uh, indicated from staff's perspective that this is something uh, worth doing relative to uh, to Aberdeen. Uh, other and still, I see you, Councillor White, and I see you, trust me. It just... just Boggle boggles my mind when I see waving hands in front of the screen all the time. It's a little disconcerting. Uh, so, so I would say, uh, you know, thank you all for coming to, you know, I think uh, an opportunity to allow this pilot to happen. It's worthwhile to, uh, to make this, uh, you know, ward issue, uh, which had strong support from the ward until, you know, it became a reality in terms of a pilot. Uh, so I would say there's always a mixed view on these issues, but, um, you know, if we, if we had listened to, you know, the opposition on Herkimer and Charlton when we moved over a parking lane, controversial at the time, if we'd listened to the opposition, it wouldn't happen. And uh, right now, it uh, I don't I don't hear any complaints uh, from anyone actually in terms of that change, or the you know the two-way conversion on James and John, very, very controversial at the time, <clears throat> done for all the right reasons. Uh, if we had listened to the opposition on that. Uh, is singularly and solely, <clears throat> they wouldn't have happened, and uh, we would still be facing uh, one-way traffic on both James and John. So I'm mindful of you know what what's the right thing to do in terms of traffic column and code zero and a lot of the things that we made commitments to, uh, but there are ancillary impacts fully understood on the mountain and other places, and that certainly ought to be calculated as we um, go forward on this. So I think, uh, you know, thank everyone for coming around to a, like a reasonable conclusion to let this pilot happen. We can measure the impacts, model the pre and post, and, uh, and then come to a decision as to whether or not it's viable going forward, including, you know, they can model, uh, you know, what the impact would be if Queen Street went all the way to King Street. I think those are all very doable things. So thank you all for your, your good sound judgment on this and, uh, and thank Councillor Whitehead for your passion on this and the passion all around. Uh, the only thing I'd ask for is, uh, you know, to, to ensure that that passion doesn't, you know, translate into the personal. Uh, so a message that I shared with you pre-council that, you know, this, we all get animated and, uh, and, you know, heated about our passionate issues, but it should never translate into personal attacks or, you know, personal motivations uh, being questioned uh, by either, you know, staff or members of council. Uh, we can disagree. Uh, we can disagree and not be disagreeable, I think, is the bottom line in all of this. And so if we can maintain that posture going forward, uh, we're going to be just fine. I would say 99% of the time that's where we're at. 
uh, let's let's see if we can go for 100 percent thank you all I, I did have indicators of second time speakers on this now i have councillor wilson not on this one thank you uh second time on this one councillor whitehead so uh again in the same tone just uh when you mentioned the, the pre numbers let, let's let's understand this is um borderline numbers so right now we're looking at 19 to 22 thousand uh, vehicles on Aberdeen, which may go up without LRT. We also know that uh, uh, complete streets guidelines say that local streets are arterial roads shouldn't have any more on a two lane than 15,000. So we're already exceeding the numbers based on our own data. So why that's why the pilot is so important. But the comment I wanted to make was uh, I wanted to thank Councillor Maureen Wilson. She's been very uh, professional on this issue. She's been steadfast. Uh, she's been working hard with her own community uh, to resolve a, an issue that she feels is very important. And certainly certain certain members of our community feel important. And I want to also recognize that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, much appreciated. I think we're uh, done with this issue. So uh, I've now got a speaker's list of uh, starting with Nan, then going to Johnson, then going to Partridge, Jackson, Clark, Wilson, and Collins on various items. So I'm gonna ask Councillor Nan, which item and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, through the mayor. Um, I the items that I'd like to speak to are 4.3, 4.5, and 4.17. Um, on 4.3, I have a really quick question to staff. Um, the uh, the sorry correspondences here are speaking to another municipality supporting the legal challenge the city of Toronto has launched against the provincial government as it relates to Bill 184 and specifically uh, the way in which that bill speaks to lifting uh, the evictions ban that was in place during COVID-19. And I'd previously spoken to staff about um, whether that was possible and uh, if there was any um, recourse or any negative uh, uh, impact to the municipality for by in endorsing another municipality's legal action. So just quickly through you, if I may, Mayor, to staff, is there just any clarity around um, uh, municipalities endorsing in this way, in which case then I would like to um, have this table consider supporting the request that's before us in this correspondence. Okay, thank you. Um, not sure who can address that uh, that's on the call. I, I mean, for, for my I don't, I don't think there's any barriers to our supporting this uh, effort. So if it's your desire to uh, to endorse this uh, you know, motion, I think that's uh, that's appropriate. Uh, Nicole Adi, I see you on the line. Is there any legal issue or any barrier to our supporting this uh, initiative by Toronto? Can't, can't hear you at this point, uh, Nicole, sorry. Uh, you're still showing you're you're muted here. My apologies, Mr. Mayor. Is that better? Okay, that's better. Thank you. Sorry. So, if the if the council motion is simply to uh, support uh, the the endeavor, then no. As if it's if we're not taking any action in the legal proceedings, then no. Simply supporting them uh, is not a concern. Thank you for that, Solicitor Audi. And in that case, yes, Mr. Mayor, I would. Okay, we just lost you there for some reason. Let's try it. There you go. Okay, you're back. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. So you want to, you want to have item to. four three uh, identified as uh, endorse? Yes, please. Okay, and we'll make On... that change. I see no objection on, unless I hear otherwise. Thank you, Councillor mm -hmm. Johnson. On that on that topic. So let's yep. let's deal with let's deal with four three. Now. <laughs> Thank you. Um... And I was absolutely, that's what I was on the speaker's list to, uh, to do as well. I think we can all agree how important child care is for the working parents, therefore the health of this economy. So I would love to second that endorsement, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that change will be made and uh, we can endorse it collectively. Councillor Nan, back to you. Thank you. For moving on to item 4.5. Um... Good news in terms of phase one funding, which we um, moved in our special uh, council meeting earlier this week in terms of receiving, if I'm correct on that procedurally. I did have a couple questions regarding phase two and just quickly, if I may, through you, Mayor, to staff, ask if um, if there is a sense of uh, what will inform the deliberations for the city's consideration for phase two funding towards transit. Um, from at a glance perspective, um, the stipulations that are laid out by the provincial government and the Ministry of Transportation as it relates to phase two funding, 
dev does have some implication as it relates to not only this term of council's priority, but our, our, our transit master plan as well, uh, as it relates to equity climate. And um, we, you know, I don't recall a conversation from a policy level about microtransit. Um, so all there's a lot of discussion to take place uh, from my opinion in terms of phase two funding. And uh, is, is staff able to respond to a timeline for when we might be considering application for phase two and how this council can deliberate on its policy implications. Gen General Manager Mike Zagarek is on the call. Mike, do you have some thoughts on timelines for the yeah. funding application? Yes, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I can start and uh, I'm not sure if Dan uh, can speak to some of the specific requirements, but phase two uh, funding applies to the period of October 1st of 2020 through to March 31st of 2021. And as Councillor Nans identified, there are some um, criteria that municipalities have to abide to, uh, including looking at some joint procurement as it relates to safety, new safety materials, uh, as Councillor Nance identified, some service sustainability and innovation uh, opportunities is a requirement requirement for municipalities to pursue, and as well, uh, fair integration and service integration is another requirement that uh, municipalities have to consider as it relates to phase two. So in terms of timing, uh, again, uh, we are still awaiting some formal reporting as it relates to phase two. We are working with ministry staff, uh, we as in City of Hamilton staff, as well as our colleagues across Ontario. Uh, and as it relates to timing, once we have a better uh, sense as to what those reporting requirements are and a better sense as to these criteria and how we have to consider these criteria as it relates to council deliberations on phase two, we'll bring that information uh, forward to committee and council uh, for your review, consideration, and direction. Thank you. Councillor Nett? Thank you. Um, I appreciate the response. So we'll have an opportunity to have that conversation as some of the stipulations do have implications for what I think is our local control and local input on uh, our transit needs as it relates to the residents of Hamilton. Thank you. Those are my questions on 4.5. Okay. Thank you. Can I uh, just just interrupt you for one moment? I know Councillor Marula needs to declare an interest, and uh, I'd like for him to be able to do that. I see Councillor Pearson's now raised her hand as well. So, Councillor Marula, go ahead and, de and declare your interest. Indeed, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. With reference to the correspondence um, from Toronto and seeking an endorsement, that would have an impact, if if uh, regardless of the outcome, would have an impact on landlords, and as a direct result of my wife and I owning a number of rental properties. I'd like to declare an interest to prevent a conflict on that item, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Pearson, I assume you're in the same position. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Same. Mayor. Yes, I. If for the same reasons, and I'm sure staff will provide me with the appropriate form to complete. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And anyone else? Okay, thank you. Councillor Nan, back to you. Oh, oh. Councillor Vanderbeek. Same issue. Can't hear you as yet, but <laughs> I, I think I can read your hand signals. Uh, you're, you're declaring an interest and as a result of the same issue. Okay. Uh, proper paperwork will come to you as well to uh, to fill out. Thank you for declaring that. Councillor Nett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Th um, through you on item 417, these are a group of correspondences in relation to the temporary emergency shelter. Uh, that is currently being prepared for at the former Cathedral Boys School in Ward 3. Um, I just wanted to make it publicly known that my office will be reaching out to set up a meeting with the residents who wrote in on this topic and submitted correspondences for Council. Many of those who submitted their correspondences here today also submitted correspondences at the Emergency Community Services Committee meeting. In fact, uh, almost exactly the same group of people. Um, so I will reach out to these individuals to set up a meeting. It's uh, unfortunate that the these uh, correspondences um, speak to a number of inaccuracies. I don't want to speak to the motives of the inaccuracies. I just want to state clearly that there's a number of inaccuracies that are, are referenced in these correspondences. And just uh, if I can, for my own clarity, uh, ask a question to the clerk to uh, clarify how 
inaccuracies ought to be corrected on the public record? Um, would me going through verbally acknowledging them be enough to set the record straight? Or uh, is there any other process by which uh, to do so? Through the mayor, we do not um, change correspondence that comes from um, members of the public. If, however, there is personal information about you on them that is incorrect, we would go in and redact that information. But as far as the accuracy of the information that's provided through communication items, we do not um, adjust that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. If I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, just speak to a couple of the points here then. Um, there is a statement in the correspondences that city councillors can invoke an emergency order. Um, is there anybody on staff that can clarify that inaccuracy? Um, an emergency order for in, in what in what sense? Like explain that. The correspondences me. refer to right. uh, a, an assumption or a misunderstanding that an individual city councillor has the power to evoke a emergency order. Right. Uh, I can confirm that that isn't the case, or else I would have done it on a number of occasions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, if uh, anyone wants to give us that power, uh, feel free to, uh, to put that out there. But, uh, you know, if uh, anyone on staff, Nicole, I would say uh, what might be the best person to give her legal opinion on that. Uh, I'm sure it'll be the same. But, Nicole, could you uh, address that? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Individual members of council do not have that authority. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, there's also a statement there that uh, I am from New York City, so just want to prove that my birth certificate does state that I was born in Canada. I've been living happily in Ontario for 18 years and proudly in Hamilton for the past eight. Um, there are also some inaccuracies in the correspondences. Uh, my staff have been working tirelessly on this file, along with myself and city staff and housing services, as well as the great people at Good Shepherd who have been taking up the mantle and making sure that this work is done diligently and compassionately at a time of, uh, you know, we're still in COVID emergency. I just really want to reinforce the fact that people are working hard, that uh, folks have heard the concerns that have been expressed in the community by a minor, by a few minority. Um, I do want to emphasize that majority of Ward 3 residents in the Stinson neighborhood and the Lensdale neighborhood have even gone as far as to indicate that they'd like to volunteer once the shelter service is up. They want to make sure that new residents that will be using this shelter are welcomed, that they have a sense of belonging, and at the same time work proactively with Good Shepherd and City Housing Services around any security concerns or those kinds of issues as they may arise. Um, there was an error referenced in the correspondences in reference to the number of residential care facilities in Ward 3, and uh, we've taken the time to email these residents and clarify that as well. And uh, we've corrected that information and apologized um, in terms of the inaccuracy of that information with staff and myself as well. So I just wanted to take a moment to say, um, you know, it's, it's important to make sure that the record is straight. And uh, I look forward to talking to these residents one-on-one -on -one and setting up those meetings to alleviate their concerns. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Councilor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to uh, ask a question on 4.4, which is correspondence from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry respecting resuming the aggregate application timelines and public consultations under the Aggregate Resources Act. As, um, as you know, we have several aggregate operations throughout the rural areas of the city, particularly in Flamborough East and Flamborough West. And um, um, I have two questions to staff, whoever can answer this. First of all, have there been any changes to the application process or is it simply being resurrected having been put on hold by COVID? Okay, thank you. I think General Manager Jason Thorne could best answer that question from the planning perspective, Jason. Uh, thank you, uh, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, it's my understanding that this only relates to the resurrection of the timelines. Um, so any Planning Act timelines, uh, statutory timelines for making decisions, for giving notifications and so on, uh, were suspended through COVID. Most of those have now been um, uh, returned to normal, and this is a notification that the same is now being done with Aggregate Resources Act. So to my knowledge, there's not any material changes to how all of that happens. It's just a question of the timelines. So thank you. I, I appreciate that answer, Jason. The reason that I ask is recently at a planning committee, uh, we did deal with some uh, proposed changes to the Aggregate Act and uh, a motion moved by myself 
with regards to um, species at risk being left within the criteria of the Environmental Assessment Act to uh, ensure that there is uh, an environmental assessment done around areas where there are species at risk. And uh, so my understanding was that the ministry did agree to leave that in, but there were some other things I, I understood uh, within the report from staff that um, perhaps were being uh, suggested by the province to pull out as well. So have we had any feedback on that? Yes. yes. So through your through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, the council is correct. There were some proposed changes uh, related to um, uh, approvals for aggregate operations in areas that were uh, habitat of uh, rare endangered species um, that was put forward as a proposal under the consultations around places to grow. Um, and, uh, and and council did oppose, oppose that change, um, as, as um, uh, Councillor Partridge noted. Um, that was a motion of, of, of Councillor Partridge and supported by council to oppose that change. Uh, and we did receive um, a couple of weeks ago, the province did announce the final changes under places to grow and they did not include that change. So they did um, accept council's uh, uh, recommendation not to make that change. Um, there were other aspects um, of that places to grow consultation um, where council was also concerned with some of the pros proposed modifications, but those changes did go ahead. Um, I did provide a bit of a verbal update at planning committee. Um, I would say most notably, um, the growth plan now requires uh, all municipalities to plan to a 2051 time horizon. Previously, it was right. 2041. Um, and one of uh, council's concerns was um, the flexibility to not necessarily expand the urban boundary to accommodate growth to 2051 and to instead um, limit that to 2041. Uh, that change uh, was not supported by, by the province. So they are now requiring municipalities to expand their urban boundaries to 2051. Um, so as a result of that, we are updating our grids to work. We are updating our municipal comprehensive review. Uh, we intended to bring that to council in uh, right about now. Um, but with these material changes to the growth plan that now requires us to plan to a 2051 horizon, um, we've got to update our supporting and consulting reports, and we're probably now looking at a December report back to council uh, to seek your direction in terms of growth priorities for the city now to 2051. Thank you, Jason. Uh, the, my last question, Mr. Mayor, is around the, um, the same 4.4. The application process and public consultation under the Aggregate Resources Act. How how are they going to do the, pub, the public consultation now under COVID? Or can you speak to that at all, Jason? Uh, yes. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I I don't have a lot of details from the province. I can say what they've been doing in other. Um, areas where they're required to do consultation, they have been relying upon the Environmental Bill of Rights Registry, which is an electronic posting of a proposed regulation or a pro proposed statutory change, and relying on written uh, comments coming in from the public. Um, it's unclear to me how they will handle hearings if, uh, if a matter does go to a hearing. Um, I know they have, under the LPAP process, been, um, I'll say, sort of experimenting with different forms of virtual hearings, yeah. um, so they may go that direction, uh, but I have not seen details from the province in terms of exactly how they will do that. Thank you, Jason, and uh, I have a few LPAT hearings in my area, so I'm uh, also uh, anxiously waiting to hear how they're going to proceed with that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those are my questions. Great. Thank you. Councillor Jackson? So far, everybody's been uh, adhering to the five-minute rule, so I haven't had to mention it, but uh, it is in place, but everyone's uh, falling in line, so thank you for that. Councillor Jackson? You always remind everyone no. when it's my turn to speak, no, Mr. Mayor. No, thank not you. True. I knew you were going to say that, but, <laughs> it's okay. but no, not true. But get, thank you, thank you all for you know keeping it concise and, con and oh, succinct. <laughs> Mr. And Mayor, thank you. Carry on. Thank yes, go ahead. Thank you. Back to four point five. The Councillor Nan time, rates. Time starts now. Go. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Back to 4.5 about the provincial um, good news announcement on the funding. I just, I'm keeping my little um, budget book here beside me, just keeping a record. So either yourself or General Manager Zagarek, could you just um, confirm for me the 17 million quoted from Minister Mulroney in, in correspondence 4.5 COVID related costs for Hamilton for transit? Was that, is that part and parcel of the 44 million? we heard about a few weeks ago, or is that the balance towards our overall $60 million COVID cost of this year that we were hoping for as well, Mr. Mayor? 
Okay, thank you. There is going to be a full reporting on that on the 23rd GIC, but uh, Mike, okay. preliminary yep. answer. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the 17 million forms one of two envelopes that the provincial federal governments have committed to Hamilton and municipalities uh, within Canada. So in addition to the 17 million being one envelope, the second envelope is a municipal relief fund which represents $27 million for the city of Hamilton. And that was based on a per capita uh, allocation. So uh, the councillor's reference to the $44 million includes the 17 million dedicated for transit. And as the okay. mayor's identified, we do have a variance report that we'll be bringing forward on September 23rd that identifies uh, staff's forecast for 2020 inclusive of the $17 million ded dedication for transit. Thank you, General Manager Zagarek. So it is part and parcel of the 44, and we are not going to, by the September 23rd GIC, we're not, Mr. Mayor, going to miss, is it an October deadline to put our invoice in for the last 16 or 17 million, correct? Yeah. So through you, Mr. Mayor, we met the first deadline. Um, council had a special council last week that gave me the authority to attest to uh, the city's request for funding and that uh, submission was due September 11th. We met that deadline and staff are working okay. towards the next deadline. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, General Manager Zagarek. Thank you. And then, you know, it's worthy for us to note with gratitude that, uh, you know, this, this funding has come through after lots of lobbying behalf of mayors uh, right across the country through AMO and FCM and uh, Greater Toronto Hamilton area mayors. Uh, we were successful in, identifying and, and getting them to uh, fund uh, our shortfall. So uh, I think overall, it's good news. We'll certainly anticipate, uh, you know, a fuller report in terms of how that all balances out, uh, you know, come the 23rd of September. So thank you to the provincial and federal governments for actually coming through uh, with gratitude. Uh, Councillor Clark on another item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The item is 4.11. It's the correspondence from Principles Integrity about their periodic report. I'm trying to understand, is this in place of an annual report or is this just one report that we're going to get throughout the year? Not sure uh, who can okay. answer that. Yep, thank you. Uh, Nicole Adi, perhaps, uh, might be best to answer that question. Sorry? Oh, there, there. I, yeah. will, so, so I will pass that over to Andrea, Jeff, actually. Actually, Jeff Abrams uh, of uh, IC, your integrity commissioner, is here, so he can uh, he can address that directly. So, Jeff. Uh, good, mor good morning. Uh, good yes. morning. Uh, it is a periodic report, only in that uh, the, the, the scope of it is beyond one year's time. Uh, we began as interim integrity commissioner in Hamilton, and uh, uh, we were not able to produce uh, a, a report at the one year mark. And so this is uh, our first opportunity to report to you. It is our intention to report more regularly in future. Ms. Clark. So is it your intention, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is it the intention to have an annual report or are we gonna have more frequent reports? No, oh, these general reports will, will, be more, uh, will be more linked to the annual calendar in future. Thank you. Um, a second question that I would have, if I may, to Mr. Abrams, um, can you or can you conceive or do you expect at any time a situation where you would be releasing a report on a specific complaint about an elected member to the public? Oh, certainly. If circumstances were such that uh, 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 there was two, two circumstances, I suppose, in broad categories. One would be if there was a, a recommendation or a conclusion on our part that a sanction might be imposed. But mm -hmm. in other circumstances, we would do that if it was we felt it necessary to clear the air to uh, provide broad-based education and that sort of thing. Thank you. And on that, my last question about the broad-based education, um, I'm wondering if it's possible in your annual reports if you would consider including uh, redacted or an an anonymized cases where complaints were filed with you and you came to the conclusion that there wasn't a case or whatever whatever the outcome is, you, you um, report on it in, in an anonymous fashion in, with the intent of educating the public about the process. We, we can certainly educate the 
public on process, but the, the reason why we do not drill down into detail with the reports that have been resolved in, informally is because uh, the, the lack of reporting, to be frank, is, is something of an incentive, and it does draw members, uh, those involved, uh, into the conversation where course correction and acknowledgement, even an apology, might end the matter. But if your point is, can we, can we articulate uh, in a more general sense uh, conclusions with respect to the uh, city of Hamilton, we can. We have to some extent done that in this report. You've, yes, you've generalized it dramatically in this report. I was looking more along the lines of what the Ombudsman of Ontario does, where they actually would show a case, a complaint was lodged, this was the allegation, here's what the, what the findings were, but you don't release names or identities. That's the way we educate the public as to what is an appropriate complaint as opposed to a vexatious one. Well, let, let me let me respond this way. Uh, of course, the, the role of an integrity commissioner is much broader than the ombudsman's, not, not in terms of jurisdiction, but in terms of the functions that an integrity commissioner carries out. It begins with uh, assisting municipalities with developing their ethical framework as a consulting role. Uh, and providing education and training. Uh, we did that as recently as this week, as you know. Uh, the most important function, we believe, is providing confidential advice, uh, hearing concerns from members, responding and providing uh, confidential advice so that uh, they are protected from, from complaints. And then there is, as we call it, a residual role, which is the, uh, the um, uh, receipt, being an independent party to receive complaints, to resolve those complaints, and if necessary, investigate and report out. So our focus is not simply on, uh, uh, you know, uh, allegations that a member has put a tone over an ethical line and drawing conclusions on that, uh, as other adjudicators do, and rightly so. Ours is much more broad-based. We take a role as, edu as a coach or teacher, we often say in, in uh, colloquial terms. And that, that's the reason why our focus in an annual report is different from the ombudsman's. Thank you for that. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank uh, Mr. Abrams. I have communicated with him a number of times seeking advice on different issues, uh, especially coming from the private sector back into to politics. Um, I can tell you that they have been prompt and their, their advice to me, their advice memorandums, I think they call them, uh, have been most comprehensive. Uh, so I, I wanna thank them for that. Um, that it, legal advice to us, which, as you know, in the past, we we didn't have that right to do. We had to hire lawyers ourselves to give us that legal advice uh, has been most helpful uh, in um, keeping me out of trouble, and I'm sure many of my colleagues. So I want to thank them for that uh, prompt service. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have a speaker's list. I think, Councillor Johnson, you wanted to speak to item 4-7. I think you... Uh, might have logged on to the right item previously. So on item 4-7 re relative to child care, your floor is yours. As soon as they unmute you. Councilor Johnson. Uh, I'll do it. Anyway, um, yes, thank you. And uh, this is the Niagara region asking for the provincial government to use, um, to have child care as become part of our essential workers and also to become a part of the overall post pandemic recovery plan. And I really want to endorse this. And I'm hoping that Councillor Nan would also be my seconder. Very thank good. you. I think that uh, I see nodding of the head there. So that'll, that'll yeah, be I figured. To endorse. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so continuing speakers now are Councillors Partridge, Nan, Jackson, and Ferguson, uh, all second time. So Part Councillor Partridge. Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Nan, back to you. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Jackson, second time. Go Mr. Ahead. Mr. Mayor, just through you to the clerks, the, I think we're all experiencing a little problem. My microphone is still showing red as if I want to speak, and I'm trying to click cancel several times, but it's still showing red, so I do not wish to speak again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I have Councillor Ferguson identified. Councillor Ferguson, on another item. Councillor Whitehead, I see you. Thank you. No, it was for the item dealing with Aberdeen, so I've already spoken to it. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Whitehead. I'm having the same trouble as Councillor. Um... Jackson, so the mic stays uh, red. Um, I do want to speak, but however, there's an issue with the e-scribe. 
Um, Ms. Mayor, I wanted to go back to the um, 4.2, and I'm not sure, was there any action on that? Because it says just we received. Uh, no, no, there's been no action. No one's spoken to that. Go ahead. Okay. Mr. Mayor, this is, uh, actually, this is uh, my home of 27 years, um, Elliott Lake. I've actually made presentations to the council in Elliott Lake, uh, dealing with WSIB and uh, the Memorial Wall. Um, they have uh, come forward, uh, Mr. Mayor, to endorse a private member's bill uh, deal with the mass nation. Uh, I'm going to pronounce that wrong. I bet. Uh, Emancipation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a timely um, um, a motion to endorse. Uh, I think it's consistent with our values and consistent with the times. And I certainly like to uh, move to endorse it. Okay. I see no uh, no argument against that from anyone. So we can make that change. Councilor Marula. I was going to a second councillor Whitehead. Uh, okay, I think we'll just make the change and then we can all endorse them collectively. I see no objection. Sure, no, okay, thank so, you. So uh, on the communications items, I see no further speakers. Can I, uh, there was a motion moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by, yep. Four point three separately. Oh, correct. Okay, that, that's right. You can uh, declare conflict. So let's deal with item 4.3 first, which is a number of uh, individuals and in, identified a conflict. So on that item, votes coming up. Either yes, no, or abstain or conflict. Councillor Jackson was. Councillor Pauls, are you able to vote? Give us a thumbs up. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbeek. Yeah, I don't see her. I, I don't see her there right now. Okay. And that's carried with uh, two identified conflicts. And on the main. To approve the communications item, it was moved by Councillor Johnson and seconded by, I can't remember who, Councillor Marula, thank you. All in favor? Yes, sir. Or as amended, yes. Councillor Pauls, thumbs up. Can't, can't hear you just yet. You still okay. have a problem. Yeah, it doesn't come up, so yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you might want to try refreshing your screen, Councillor Pauls. Founder Vanderbeek is back. And we need your vote. Thumbs up. I don't know what I'm voting for. Uh, you're voting on the communications as amended. Okay. Yeah. Without four or three in it, right. Thank you. Thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to item 5.1 now, committee reports. Uh, Councillor Nan, you have a motion regarding the Mayor's Task Force on Economic Recovery Report 2004. Yes? Yes, please. Um, through you, Mayor, move to receive the report. One second, Councillor Nan. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Councilor Johnson, let me, I, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Councilor Johnson, we need a motion for, uh, to move into Committee of the Whole, uh, if you could, please. Certainly, it's moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Pearson, that the Council move into the Committee of the Whole to consider committee reports. Thank you, and there's an electronic vote on that. My apologies for the miss. Yeah, <laughs> the ladies have let it go. Just just this time, they're giving me a pass, but don't do it again. <clears throat> okay. Councillor Pauls, thumbs up. Thank I'm you. I'm going to refresh it because. Okay. Um... And that's carried. Thank you. And back to the task. Thank you. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Zanko that the Mayor's Task Force on Economic Recovery Report be received. 
Thank you. Any comments or questions? Councilor Farr, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just have one. Um, you have, well, maybe two. Through to you, um, a development subcommittee on this task force, do you not? Is that what it's called? I think Terry Johns is the chair. Right. Yep. Through you then to uh, Jason Thorne um, or yourself, uh, I don't see any fulsome reporting back on development. And of course, planning committee, we doubled down uh, actually on our schedule this summer uh, with uh, Councillor Collins' uh, direction early on. And so I'm wondering through you, to you or, or Jason, if there is an imminent uh, development subcommittee um, report coming uh, from your good task force? And if so, uh, when can we see that in advance? Because I'm thinking maybe with our planning committee meetings, there'll be opportunities to expedite some of the ideas that may or may not be more obvious. I haven't seen the report, I don't know, so through you. Okay, thank you. I can I can share with you. I think the intention was that the, all the task forces are still working through their task force and their recommendations haven't been vetted to the uh, the task force as a whole as yet, and so I anticipate that their reporting will happen sometime uh, late October to uh, bring it as a full package of uh, recommendations from the task force as a whole with all of the different sectors identified. So that's still a work in progress. Uh, the task force hasn't yet seen all of the recommendations as yet. They're still kind of mapping them out and putting them on paper. And so we anticipate by the end of October that we'll have a more fulsome report on all sectors to, uh, to council. Uh, and, you know, obviously uh, whatever committee it needs to go to at that point. Council Farr? That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on it? Seeing none, a, uh, just a motion to receive the uh, mayor's task force report. Electronic vote should pop up in a second. That was a short second. And thank you. Do we need any thumbs up indicators? Councillor Vanderbeek. Again, not, not showing on the screen at this point. Councillor Whitehead, thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, that's carried. Thank you. Item five is the planning committee report. Uh, Councillor Farr, can I have a motion, please, to put the report on the floor and move by yourself? Thank you and seconded by Councillor Pearson. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions on the planning report, item 5-2? I see Councillor Ferguson for starters. Go ahead, Councillor Ferguson, identify the item. And uh, thank you, just a question, oh, item two, and okay. uh, the planning report, and a question to Mr. Thorne. Jason, uh, at the planning committee meeting, I inquired about when the Comorant Road would be open as the paving was completed in mid-August, and, and so it's been over a month, and the answer I got was, uh, I would get a date by the end of the day, and it's now been over a week. Do we have a date yet when we could set up an official opening to celebrate this for the community and for the industrial park? Mr. Thorne? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we are, we're we're waiting for a couple of date options to find dates that won't interfere because there is active construction going on related to the, uh, the, the Valerie subdivision in the area. Um, so I, I, I believe we were sent some possible um, uh, dates for next week that would not interfere with their construction schedule. Um, so uh, staff can forward those options to to the councillor um, and we should be able to do something I would I would hope next week. Um, we just have to work around the, uh, as I said, around the construction schedule for the adjacent development. Yeah, we need, uh, I know that uh, Norm uh, wants to set up an official opening so that we can get some publicity to it to help with the people commute every day into that industrial park. And so I need a little bit of notice to work with Norm to get that put together. And, but as I mentioned at the meeting, the road's been paved for weeks. Uh, I drove in the weekend, the rock check dams are all in place. The uh, catch basins are all done. I agree the grading is back in the retention pond, which shouldn't affect the road. So I'm curious to know why it's delaying the opening. And if you want to get back to me offline, cause you may not have the answer to that yourself. I would like to know that because I've sent three or four emails out trying to get a date and I can never get a reply back on them. 
So through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, it's okay with the councillor. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up off the line. I'll just get the uh, the latest update from staff before I do that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Any uh, further comments on planning matters? I don't see any. Okay, thank you. So we'll turn to a vote on uh, planning report 5-2 and seconded. All in favor? Any votes that we need thumbs up on? Councillor Vanderbeek still not appearing as uh, anyone else? Oh, thank you. That's carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, a motion on the General Issues Committee report of September the 9th, 2020. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Whitehead that the General Issues Committee report 20-2 Zero one two being the meeting held on Wednesday, September 9th, 2020, be received and the recommendations contained therein be approved. Great, thank you. Any items on the General Issues Committee report that anyone wants to speak to? Not seeing any, oh, yep, Councillor Jackson, then Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, two items. Um, item number five, uh, just to receive the Tim Hortons field, and guard anchor repair replacement. Uh, I was a lone wolf on that one. That's okay. I lost that uh, not to defer by 12 to one, but that's okay, Mr. Mayor, to you and the rest of my colleagues. Anyways, uh, what I'm wondering, Mr. Mayor, is um, is staff still on track, uh, both um, through facilities, but, but more importantly, through the legal department, that they're gonna come back for sure by September 23rd to GIC to tell us about um, legally what we're going to do, uh, much to my chagrin and holding up the much needed repairs at Tim Hortons Field Stadium, or is this uh, potentially gonna be postponed and drag on and on? Through you, Mr. Okay. Mayor, please. I see uh, Jeanette Smith on the call. So Jeanette, for starters, and then Nicole, if need yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to members of council, yes, I can confirm uh, that we are planning to bring that report on September 23rd to provide the further information as requested by council. Okay. All right. I'm satisfied with that for now, Mr. Mayor. Don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that. I have one other item. Go ahead. All right. Item seven, Mr. Mayor, I just want to give a shout out. It's about the Airport Employment Growth District, and we had a wonderful presentation by now a soon to be any day now, outgoing director, special project manager, Guy Pepperella, and his outstanding several decades of service, both pre-amalgamation and since amalgamation, and primarily shepherding the tremendous growth and potential that the John C. Monroe International Airport is experiencing, the Panettone announcement, of course, the Amazon, the jobs, the commercial manufacturing taxes, uh, Mr. Mayor, and if anyone is looking at the actual picture of the Airport Employment Growth District uh, from Upper James over to Lancaster Road, south of 20, right back to Mount Hope, it's um, it's truly could be the sleeper of the economic engine in our city helping us coming out of COVID in terms of a few thousand jobs further that are going to be created. A lot of that was because of the leadership of Director and now Special Projects Manager Guy Preparella, and I didn't want that to go unnoticed. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Here, here. Well said and uh, well-deserved accolades for Guy Preparella for a long career with the City of Hamilton in many facets. So uh, my hope is that uh, as we continue discussions around the airport that we may be able to retain him in some fashion so that we can maintain that continuity and knowledge, which I think is uh, going to be very important. So. Uh, his days may not be over just yet, but notwithstanding that, it's certainly uh, you know worthy of uh, acknowledging a long career with the city of Hamilton. It's been spectacular. Councillor Whitehead, on this matter or something else? Yeah, and I am eight, Mr. Uh, Mayor, and I think I need to provide some clarification, some correspondence I sent out in in that context. So, Mr. Mayor, I sent a a, a letter out uh, talking about the comparison to San Francisco, and I was very graphic in my description, and that was done purposeful because the impacts on neighborhoods uh, is, is astounding. And I understand that uh, there's our experts and advocates and activists uh, that go out, but they go out with a very narrow lens and not understand the impacts of their surroundings. So it might be good for the, uh, the approach with the people within the encampment, but it's certainly not good for the broader uh, community. 
And San Francisco is a good example of that. So I sent a letter out, uh, talked about what, uh, in fact, there's complaints about uh, environmental in the harbor because of the hosing down of sidewalks and then paraphernalia and all the other stuff I talked about. That's a reality. That's not made up. That's not fear mongering. That is an actual circumstance as a result of a tent city in a different uh, community. The other issue, Mr. Mayor, is uh, I sent a letter out to uh, a particular advocate. And in that letter, I talked about asking our legal about legal uh, liability. The reason I asked that question, and every professor should know this, there's one thing to advocate. It's another thing to uh, advocate to breach the current laws in place. When we have bylaws, zoning bylaws, and so forth that indicate that you can't do something, and you're out there advocating and, and collecting tents openly to promote people uh, breaking that bylaw, that I would suggest that that could be a liability. I think it's a worthy question of asking. So when I put that letter out, Mr. Mayor, it had no other intention other than to inform the individual that those actions could be seen as libelous and that she should take that under consideration and so should her organization. And I think that is a responsible thing to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Farr. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. On, on eight and not uh, nine, on uh, the public report on encampments through you to staff, uh, I mentioned um, in our debate last week um, and, and wanted to make clear, and I think we want to do that as much as possible on this issue, that we appreciate everyone who's working collaboratively with the city and, and um, this encampment issue and our achievements to date. So last week we talked about uh, 177 interactions with encamped individuals since the pandemic and approximately 128 homeless and encamped individuals accessing more safe, more humane conditions like shelters, hotels, which have always been available and will be available. And even eight housed, we statistically mentioned, eight people going directly to housing. Can we get an update on that outreach success this week, if there is one, Mr. Uh, Mayor? Okay. Uh, Paul Johnson, I'm assuming, will be on the call. So, Paul, do you have any update on success in terms of housing people? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm not sure we've updated the numbers since last week, but uh, I'll ask uh, David Buckhol uh, to jump in, who's also on the call, if we do have updated numbers. Thank you. David? Uh, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, you, Mr. Mayor. We uh, have 100, over 190 known people by name. Uh, through those, we've housed 11 people directly from encampments, and over 130 have flown through to shelters or hotel. Thank you. Uh, over 130 now. Thank you. Through you, uh, I counted approximately, Mr. Mayor, 60 tents on Ferguson this morning. Down five at York, 10 tents, uh, but they're, of course, downtown on Heritage Property, Whitehern, uh, on the Bay, Trails, Under Bridges, uh, Park, uh, all over the ward in every neighborhood. So uh, it there's been tremendous growth, and that growth quite obviously has coincided with uh, downtown law firm Ross McBride's uh, successful convincing of the judge to allow this injunction. And uh, also the success of HamSmart Keeping Six, who are among the appellants, uh, most paid by the Ministry of Health, if not all, um, and their 100 tent, tent drive. Um, I think they got their 100 tents, not sure, but certainly looks like it. So what's the count now, uh, Mr. Buckle, through you, Chair, um, in terms of what we have out there? And, and citywide is good too, please. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, 19 known and active encampments throughout the city. Uh, approximately 150 unique individuals are sleeping at the encampments. Um, so that's the update that we have right now citywide. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, far. Thank you okay. for the report and thank you, Mr. Mayor. We will have a fulsome discussion in camera as well, as you all know. Councillor Whitehead, second time. Different topic. I did the same topic. I had a call from a, um, a very emotional woman uh, whose child died of a drug overdose. He lived in the encampment in Ferguson. He, um, she did everything she could to help him uh, on the right path. He um, often came home or seen her mother beaten up, black eyes, bruises everywhere, and she would often ask what, what happened, and he would talk about how he was robbed and beat up at the encampment. Mr. Mayor, he's dead now, and the mother said, how does the encampment, how does the encampment and this policy help her son? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Okay, thank you. I see uh, no further speakers on uh, these items. We are referring uh, the litigation to the in-camera section, I believe, for a September the 16th council meeting. So uh, we will not be voting on the report until that issue has been dealt with. And so we're going to go to the next report, which is the 5-4, the Emergency Community and Services Committee report. Hmm? Go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, we can vote on the GIC report right oh, now. Okay. All right. We not, so separate it's item. Sep it's a separate end. item okay. in the confidential. Right. Yes. Thank you. So on the report as a whole, then, as, uh, as presented, uh, all in favor or opposed? Or abstaining for whatever reason. Didn't hear any abstentions on that one. Thank you. All good. Everybody voted. Thank you. That's great. We're looking looking good. Uh, Councillor uh, Item Five Four. Community Services, Councillor Pauls, may I have a motion to uh, receive and approve the recommendation? Thank you, Mayor. That the Emergency and Community Committee. Can you, turn your, can you turn your video on so we know that you're there? I you're am the on. Real can Esther you Pauls? see me? Can't see you. You can't see me? No, I don't see it here. I could see you clear. Okay. Okay. Can you see me now? All right, no, so it's it's on my my tablet for whatever reason. So go ahead. Okay. Can you Councillor Councillor Pauls, sorry, your video is off now. If you could turn it back on. I just did. No, you I have to do it again. I have to do it again. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Do you okay, I just did. Can you see me now? No, it must be your video, sorry. No, please proceed. I, okay. Go. Actually, uh, I could see everyone and I could see myself. So, okay, that the Emergency and Community Committee Report 2006 begin the meeting held on Thursday, September 10, 20, be received and that the recommendation contained therein be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, well put. Uh, any items your seconder would be? Councillor Jackson. Thank you. And uh, any items on the report that people want to discuss? Not seeing a flurry of hands. Thank you. So we'll go to the report vote. All in favor? Everybody voted once again. Everybody's dialed into the voting process. That's great. All that's carried unanimously. Item five five. There's hallelujah being uh, arms are in the air for praise for the vote. Uh, it's five five. Public Works Committee report. Councillor Danko, a motion please to put the report on the floor. Sorry. My apologies again, uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, you need to. Uh, Put a motion forward to waive the 48 hour uh, notification period. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, as the public works report wasn't sent out by 9.30 a.m. on Monday morning, we will have to move the following motion. So it's moved by myself and seconded by Chair Councillor Danko that section 5.72 of the city's procedural bylaw 18-270, which provides the minimum of 48 hours shall pass before a standing committee report is presented to council, be waived in order to consider the public works committee report 20-007. Great, thank you. And the uh, vote is before you. Two thirds majority required. I assume that that's going to happen. Councillor Collins, thank you, thumbs up. And that's carried and then back to Councillor Danko, a motion on the public work report, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Councillor Marula, that the Public Works Committee Report 20-007, being the meeting held on Friday, September 11th, 2020, be received and the recommendations contained therein be approved. And, and be shaken and not stirred. Never mind. So.
Uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Wilson, uh, you had an item you wanted to speak to, as do I, and then Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is uh, with respect to item number five, the repair of the Valley Inn Road Bridge. I don't sit on public works. I didn't have an opportunity to speak to it last Friday and I would like to do so now. Uh, this is very much a good news story for the residents of Ward 1 and the entire city. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the McNally Foundation um, again, um, re reaffirming their well-established legacy of giving um, and their philanthropy with purpose, which typically is um, one of securing our ecological integrity, the social resiliency of this city, and in this case, a bridge which connects two cities um, and many communities, and of course, um, the beloved properties of our RBG. Um, Another comment quickly, um, when Mike McNally called me in July and told me that the foundation was very interested in, in doing this, um, he said he'd like it to be done as quickly as possible. He felt its importance as did the entire foundation. Um, and so we went to work and one person in particular went to work and I'd like to recognize her now, um, Erica Waite in our public works department, who Mr. McNally described as um, after many conversations amongst us as principled, pragmatic and professional. And I couldn't agree more. So I would like to extend my, um, my thanks to her and all the work that she has done on on this um, without much holiday at all this summer, Mr. Mayor. So thank you again to the McNally Foundation for this tremendous gift and thank you to our outstanding staff. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this topic? So if I might uh, just, just reiterate as well, uh, gratitude to the McNally Foundation and Mike McNally. They, uh, they, uh, they forever have the interest of uh, the development of our city at heart. And uh, I can assure you that the, both the RBG and uh, Burlington are on board to get this work done expeditiously. And uh, I will too uh, reiterate uh, Erica Waite, uh, I've had a number of conversations with and ha has really uh, made it happen uh, in a in a quick and expeditious way. And, you know, no small thing to have uh, someone step forward and say, I'll, I'll commit to a million dollars towards uh, making this project happen. It's anticipated it won't be that much, but uh, it uh, it certainly builds in a reasonable amount of contingency to get the work done and have that bridge replaced uh, fully sometime around springtime of, uh, of next year, which I think is uh, about as expeditious as we can get given the procurement process and everything else that needs to happen. Uh, thanks go to Maureen Wilson as well. A lot, a lot of hard work on, on uh, you know, facilitating this and bringing it to the right people and getting the right work done by the right people. So thank you for all of your good work on this. And again, McNally Foundation are forever stepping up and uh, supporting projects that uh, the foundation was intended to, to you know, to work on. And, uh, you know, he, he would say simply, Mike McNally would, well, we're just doing what the foundation tells us to do. Well, yes, but it's still, you know, someone set up that foundation uh, through the generosity of the McNally family, and uh, certainly they uh, they look for opportunities to be helpful. And in this case, they are extremely helpful because otherwise, this would probably not be on a top priority list for us to do. And so, uh, it's a huge connection opportunity for a lot of the gardens in the RBG. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly between Hamilton and Burlington, and you know what has sentimental value beyond that because everyone who has run around the bay, uh, rivers, heartbreak hill and, you know, crossing that bridge. And then you have to do that last little stretch up the hill. That was one issue. Uh, <laughs> also a lot of fishing and a lot of recreation going on in that area. So uh, very important, uh, very important uh, investment. And uh, the fact that the McNally family foundation is making it is, uh, is to be thanked for. So thank you all for that good work. And thank you, Councillor Wilson, for your good support on this. Very well done. On other items, then Councillor Whitehead. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, item three, which I unfortunately wasn't there for because uh, of an interpretation of a rule that I've dealt with uh, with Madam Clerk. Uh, 
I believe natural justice has always prevailed in language and there's ambiguity. Uh, the clerk and I have a difference of opinion, but we do agree there's ambiguity. So we have uh, purposefully said we would work to amend the procedural bylaw to ensure that it's clear and following the best practices in natural justice that everyone has a right to appeal. And that is in respect to the actions that were was taken uh, by the chair of the day. The action the chair took was appropriate. I want to make clear people understand that. But the right for appeal was not, in my opinion. Uh, in Madam Clerk's opinion, there is ambiguity and she sees it a different way, but she understands uh, the natural law. She also understands that we need to address and clear that language. So I want to put that on the table right away. And so respectfully, um, I'm not, uh, no criticism to anyone other than let's fix the language. Mr. Mayor, and I also want to thank the, those who are there uh, to, to uh, support uh, my motion in regards to the uh, Complete Street report. I also um, want to ask staff, because I think this is so important, and I've been hammering this one for over eight years now, what is the status of our guidelines for Complete Streets? Because something like Aberdeen and all these is other issues may not even happen if we understood what the guidelines would uh, tell us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan McKinnon. Or Jason. Yep. Yes, Jason so through you, Mr. Mayor, the Complete Streets guidelines actually reside within the Transportation Planning Group of, uh, of PED. Okay. Um, and so we did retain the consultant to lead that exercise earlier this year, uh, and we are looking forward to have the draft guidelines um, out for uh, uh, community input by the end of the year. Um, and, and, and I'd agree with the councillor that the, the hope is that as we have those guidelines in place, it will start to define um, kind of what I referred to as typologies of different design treatments for different functionalities of roads. Um, so that is the piece of work that we are we are working on. Um, it is underway. And like I said, we were looking to have something out for a, a community consultation uh, by the end of the year. And I, I thank you for that because eight years ago when I was reading uh, Calgary's guidelines and, and Edmonton's guidelines and many, many cities across North America already have guidelines in place and we seem to fall, and we usually lead on these issues, but apparently we've fallen behind uh, on this particular issue. and. So right now, I've always compared it to the wild, wild west, because unless you have, and the neighbors, ha, ha, neighbors have an understanding of what uh, the parameters and constraints in the context of decision-making uh, they have, then uh, it becomes um, one without constraints, uh, one that isn't comprehensive, one that isn't interconnected in regards to the um, priorities and the uses and the, uh, and, and the rationale between our whole transportation network. So it is paramount. The sooner we get these guidelines in place, sooner we can end the wild, wild west approach uh, to uh, traffic calming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Different item. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Item four. Thanks to uh, unanimous support of the Public Works Committee. Uh, another uh, floral beautification conversion in Ward Six that will occur uh, if this ratifies today on upper gauge with the two traffic islands both entering and exiting the overpass along upper gauge. And um, I'm really pleased about um, the image of our city. And I wanna pass along, Mr. Mayor, not just in my East Mountain community with all the conversions that you know I'm a big fan of, as I know you are, but I have had a number of constituents, Mr. Mayor, who have driven by our city hall. And even though it's nowhere near as busy as it would have been pre-COVID, they have sent me emails and phone calls, which I've passed along to manager Sam Scartlett of our horticultural forestry division, just how much they admire the glorious majestic view and the beauty of the forecourt of our city hall. It's even more spectacular this year than it's ever been. So I wanted to pass that along, along with my, my gratefulness to my colleagues at Public Works for the upper gauge item today. Thank you for that. And uh, can I re reiterate uh, how appreciative uh, I hear the public is relative to the beautification that's happened throughout the city, uh, the work that they've done, and uh, the, the fact that we're in a kind of a COVID situation, which, uh, you know, can lead to anxiety and uh, 
some some folks feeling down that uh, you know that beautification it was very important for us to continue to focus on with the support of council uh, because it, it really does make people feel good to know that uh, that that attention to detail hasn't gone away and that we continue to uh, respect and appreciate and, and beautify our city uh, notwithstanding the challenges that we're facing I think it's important work that uh, needs to continue uh, needs to expand in fact if we can make it expand and you know here today we're doing that to beautification on, uh, on upper gauge which is fantastic uh, but throughout the city I get nothing but compliments and uh, those compliments accrue to the great horticultural team that have done all of this work so thanks to all of them you, on behalf of all of us for thank the great you, work Mayor. that we're doing thank you uh, first time speaker Councillor Clark and then Councillor Wilson and then Councillor Ferguson thank you <laughs> Councillor Clark Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the item is item number three, the complete streets report for Ward 14. Yep. Uh, let me state from the get-go, I'm not opposed to this motion at all. I think it's an appropriate thing to do, and I, I give credit to the ward councillor for moving forward in that manner. Um, my concern is we're kind of doing these complete streets reports on wards uh, piecemeal. And when we make some changes in one ward, we may impact traffic flows in another ward, which we've already had a very impassioned conversation about. So I'm trying to understand how the city as a whole will be looking at complete streets assessments in wards where, for example, I don't have $149,000 in discretionary funding to, to get a traffic calming initiative like this. So how do we how do we reconcile all of the wards when we're looking at complete streets? Thank you. Jason Thorne. Yes, yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm a, I, I can start and then I can ask uh, 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 Dan or I don't know if somebody from um, um, uh, Rhodes is on the line. Uh, so there's two things here with respect to the complete streets guidelines, as Councillor uh, had alluded to earlier, the hope there is that we'll provide some overall design guidance for when streets are programmed either for the construction of a new street or if a street is programmed for a reconstruction uh, the complete street guidelines will provide some direction in terms of what the design uh, principles and design treatments should be when that happens uh, with respect to some of the vision zero initiatives which which uh, i think this motion uh, speaks to um, as did the the motion um, with regards to ward eight at the previous meeting um, uh, Public Works uh, does the implementation of the of the Vision Zero initiatives uh, through their traffic group, um, and I and I I do understand they've done some uh, sort of a prioritization framework for how to uh, respond to requests for Vision Zero traffic calming type treatments, um, and how to engage on those, um, especially where they may uh, cause impacts in neighboring uh, neighboring wards or neighboring neighborhoods. Uh, so, with respect to the Vision Zero work, I'm not sure if Dan has anything further to add on that one. Okay, Dan McKenna. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the Complete Streets Guideline will, will certainly provide a framework through which we can undertake these assessments, and it will, you know, um, ensure that we're looking comprehensively to make sure that anything we do in one area doesn't uh, adversely impact another. Uh, in the absence of it, I can tell you that our gang will do that regardless. Uh, we just won't be doing it within a, a, a kind of a comprehensive framework. So any recommendations that are uh, a result of this uh, study uh, will be analyzed against the broader transportation network to make sure that we're not having any adverse impacts on those uh, arterial roads or uh, general movement throughout the city. Thank you. Councilor Clark. So how do we address the issue that um, I guess the wards one through eight in the city have the funds available to do such studies, whereas the other wards don't have those those funds. So how do they get a complete streets report? Um, so, Jason, if you want to give it a whirl, Mike Garrick is on the uh, on the call as well. In in my mind, Mr. Mayor, if I may, a complete streets report is an assessment and a function of public works and if an assessment and a function of the city of Hamilton. To fund it through to the discretionary funds from the area rating budget um, creates this this nuance uh, where um, we're not being congruent with all of the words across the city. And that's the challenge for me. Thank you. Jason Thorne and Dan McKinnon or Mike Segarek. Jason. 
Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, again, the, the, the complete streets guidelines um, are, are more of a design guideline that becomes a reference point for, for what sorts of uh, treatments might be appropriate in a given circumstance. In terms of the funding of, of specific um, or refer to them as vision zero traffic calming type measures, um, there are some, and Mike or Dan might be able to speak to us, there are some general funds allocated within the annual operating budget, and I believe some of the red light camera funds as well. Um, have been allocated to some of those, um, and they are prioritized through public works uh, in terms of which initiatives will go forward. Um, and uh, I, in, in terms of a, a, a ward specific overall study, um, the only ones that I'm aware of are the, are the two recent ones, this one that's in front of you today and the, and the ward 8 one that was funded previously. Um, there may be others, but, but I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. Thank you. Dan McKinnon? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, these, these have, started to kind of come onto our radar and uh, we're, we're, I guess we're evolving as we go here. Uh, we could certainly report back to council as to the effort that it would take to to do the entire city and the associated budget with that, if that's uh, council's will, and then that can be, uh, uh, ultimately that would be direction of council if we were to proceed with that. Council Clark. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I'll, and I'll support this this motion today. Uh, I guess the challenge I'm having is that the vision zero and the complete streets principle are citywide. And so we adopted them as a city and we should be looking to implement them in all wards and not just in wards that have access to discretionary funding. And, and that's my challenge. So I'll leave it to staff to figure out if there's a way of doing that. Um, but I think it would be much more successful if we did it holistically across the entire city than just um, individual awards that have the money to do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Councillor Ferguson on this topic. It's, it's on the public works report. Um, okay. I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm pleased and thank Councillor Jackson for bringing up the city hall beautification. I was in city hall yesterday and hadn't seen it for a while and it's absolutely stunning again. I also want to add that Wilson Street, Russo Street, Gulf Links Road, the island traffic islands are in amazing shape. Um, there's no uh, COVID reason for not doing it. It's, it's um, you know, our horticulture department just seems to be amazing year after year. And I want to point out again, I know I've done this before. I, I drive by these islands, as do a lot of citizens regularly. And there's always crews working out there, weeding or planting. And despite the stereotype of city workers, no one's leaning on their shovel. No one's inside the truck. Everybody's working and it's so refreshing to see. I don't know who hires these young people and trains them, but they just do an amazing job and have an incredible work ethic. So to Dan McKinnon and all his team of over at Horticulture, I just want to extend uh, my deep gratitude for the great work they're doing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well-deserved accolade for sure. Councillor Wilson and then Councillor Jackson, both second time. Councillor Wilson. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm not on the list. I, I was okay. on for item five and I've spoken to that. Thank All you. All right, I'm gonna ask Lorna to turn her fan on because she's actually, <laughs> just kidding. Councillor Jackson, you're up. Second time, no, not for you either. And I see Councillor Whitehead one more time. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the first time um, another councillor had moved this motion on complete streets, I had the same concern because we're all one city and not everyone has the same access to funds. So Councillor Clark's comments, believe it or not, I, um, I fully understand and appreciate. Um, we shouldn't be creating uh, you know, poor cousins in the community, which be ensuring that there's equity and distribution on all things that are important in, as we address our, our road network. So I was concerned and I raised the very questions Councillor Clark um, raised on the original uh, motion that came forward, that should this not be done in a comprehensive way, citywide versus um, being dealt an award way, which again creates have and have nots. So I wanna uh, reiterate, have the greatest of respect uh, and um, concern uh, that um, this was a precedence that staff uh, allowed to happen originally so obviously I'm following that precedence, but I do uh, with all my heart uh, agree with Councillor Clark that this isn't a comprehensive way to approach things, especially in light of the fact that the guidelines aren't in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I've got myself on the speaker's list on this item. So let me just follow through. Uh, what I see in item A, 
uh, the way I read it, and someone can clarify for me if uh, they could, that uh, even though it's the staff be authorized and directed to retain a consultant to undertake review of designated Ward 14 neighborhoods with the intent of providing a complete streets report, identifying areas of concern and recommendations to provide a safer environment for all road users based on Vision Zero and complete streets principles. So is there not some universality associated with this once this report is done that uh, we end up with some complete streets criteria that we're going to measure other projects against uh, once this report is done uh, through you to uh, Jason or through you to I think Councillor Johnson is in the chair through you to Jason Thorne is there not some sense that we're going to end up with some criteria that's going to be helpful right across the city yes Mr. Through, Thorne? Through thank you yes so through you Mr. Mayor and and, and probably better for public works to answer this one because they they do do the vision zero um, guidelines and prioritization framework Okay. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, in terms of uh, both this initiative and the one in, in uh, Ward 8, um, uh, if, if there are inputs from those that do help to inform the complete street guidelines, I expect there would be and vice versa, uh, that I think as we get more experience rolling out these kinds of initiatives on different streets and in different contexts across the city, um, they do become quite valuable inputs either to um, this round of developing the complete street guidelines or the future updates to those uh, to those guidelines. So you have to have some citywide um, broader broader benefit. Yep. Dan McKenna to uh, yeah, through you, uh, Madam Chair, the, uh, I agree with uh, Jason. The work through this study uh, will complement and inform the complete streets guideline and vice versa. And there's no uh, there's no question that uh, tactics or measures that are identified through this work will be applicable in other parts of the city, but uh, I suspect that um, in, in there's individual scenarios and physical situations that uh, may be unique to different wards or just different streets that would be have to, that we would have to look at specifically. Uh, I suspect for Edward and his team, uh, the idea of doing this in a comprehensive way across the city and getting the funds to do that would be music to their ears. I think we'd love to bring back a report to identify uh, just how we would approach this and uh, give council a sense of what kind of uh, dollars would be involved. But uh, taking a comprehensive approach to this is, is I suspect, is music to uh, Edward's ears as well as his staff. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. We have on this item now speakers, Pauls, Nan, and Marula on this item. Councillor Pauls? Yes. Uh... Uh, okay, I actually have taken myself off, but I do want to say something. Um, uh, with the complete street uh, study, the problem is now that we have Ward 8 and Ward 14, and that's half of the mountain. In my ward, there's been a lot of uh, calls. I've been actually visiting people about the unsafe street with the uh, speed limits, and I'm putting speed bumps. So they're asking me, if I'm going to do the same thing, and the problem, I even asked Councillor Jackson if he would go with me and maybe we could do the whole mountain. But I was wondering, and I want to ask um, uh, whoever can answer this, would it have been easier and cost effective if we have done it all together instead of putting 150, 150, 150? And uh, so that was my suggestion even to Councillor Jackson. Let's work together so we could spend less money and do it together. So what is going forward? I need to be clear because I have constituent calling me. When are you doing the study? When are you doing uh, my speed bumps? Uh, it, it is a problem right now. Thank you. Dan McKinnon? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, again, doing this in a comprehensive way is something that we would love to do. I suspect that uh, it's going to have a, a decent sized price tag to it, but uh, I will uh, definitely be following up with Edward after this meeting to make sure that we uh, schedule a report to get back in front of council to uh, advise of what the benefits are. Uh, I, I suspect there's very little drawbacks to this approach and a comprehensive way of doing this is the way to go. And we can identify what we think the costs and the timeline would be to do a, a comprehensive uh, study in each one of the uh, wards. Thank you, Councillor Pauls. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have Councillor Nan. 
Thank you, through the mayor. I'm really pleased to hear the support for complete streets and implementation of our citywide um, priorities around Vision Zero to be applied across the entire city. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, this is work that is overdue, and I'm really, really encouraged by um, the ongoing conversations I've had with staff, um, both in PW as well as in planning around the need for comprehensive and holistic approaches to implementing solutions that help move our municipality towards being a safe place in terms of our roadway versus the piecemeal approach that we've had to, I believe previous councils have had to take because of the funding uh, priorities that previous councils have made. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the discussion that's here. I'm, I'm hopeful that that will result in adequately investing in both the studying aspect of uh, the, the neighborhoods and every single ward in the city, but also to implement the capital solutions that are required to build the infrastructure, redesign some of the streets historically. Frankly speaking, from a Ward 3 perspective, I've been having this conversation since I got into this uh, into office uh, this term with staff about the need for a holistic approach and even offering Ward 3 up as a guinea pig for implementation of many of the kind of uh, initiatives we'll see uh, being put forward in terms of the guidelines of the complete streets work. Um, so that said, I just wanted to make sure that our council colleagues are clear. Um, this has been an ongoing conversation I've been having around Ward 3, and I would definitely welcome um, the opportunity to add Ward 3 to that mix. But hearing very clearly uh, around this table the increased support for making sure that it's a holistic approach to the entire um, the city of Hamilton. Um, some of our wards are historically and 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 uh, been um, subject to road design that is very old in comparison to other neighborhoods in the city. Uh, so it's one consideration that I would ask for uh, through you, Mayor, to staff, and I can offline this is from that perspective of those of us dealing with a legacy of issues um, in terms of the built environment that goes back 75 years, goes back 100 years, and in some cases goes back 50 years. Um, those decisions have wreaked havoc in terms of safety in our neighborhoods and particularly in the lower city and uh, specifically I can speak to it in terms of Ward 3. So encouraged by the conversation, I hope it results in uh, increased investment to make sure this work happens citywide. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just quickly, a couple of items I want to elaborate on only because I, I don't want to give any false impression uh, about why Councillor Dankel is able to do this through the Area Rating Fund. Um, so going going back about a decade, if not more, um, it was determined through an exhaustive and protracted period of time um, that the our suburban colleagues, um, because of the Area Rating issues surrounding Parks and Rec, that rather than seeing savings in taxes, they wanted us to create this Area Rating Fund rather than apply it to decrease taxes. So it was a compromise position uh, that has worked w well, and one that I think we've tried to offer up as a as an opportunity for the suburban councillors. And I'm just wondering through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to staff or to one of the councillors that might be involved with that discussion, uh, why the area rating program hasn't been applied to our suburban colleagues. Okay, I don't. I don't want to get pulled into this rabbit hole because that's. Well, uh, you know, I'm just trying to clear the air. It's just not the uh, topic that's on the agenda today. But uh, all that is, Mike Segura. I'm asking what the status of it. No, is. no, I understand. I understand. Okay. Yep. So let's get the status, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll kind of move on from there. Uh, yep. Mike Segura, I know there's been yep. discussions. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we have uh, modeled some scenarios as it relates to extending the uh, capital reinvestment or area rating uh, reserves to the uh, to the wards who currently don't have access to those funds. Uh, the discussions do reoccur during the budget process as this would represent a levy impact to those wards. So again, staff have provided some scenarios and uh, we would await direction from, from committee and council as it relates to the potential implementation of any of those scenarios or alternative scenarios. Thank you. Okay, I, I just simply wanted to emphasize that the inequity that exists is, is by design and one that was encouraged by by suburban colleagues. If, if it's something that they want to revisit, I'm the first one to say I support the initiative first and foremost. Uh, secondly, uh, on this complete streets uh, scenario, 
I'm, I'm really pleased to hear uh, all of the positive comments. Uh, I can assure you, if you can rewind uh, time 10, 15 years ago, um, this discussion uh, would have been a whole lot different. So there is a great deal of acceptance through the understanding that complete streets does make a neighborhood safer. Um, so I just want to truly emphasize that because I know uh, looking back over the last 15 years, particularly in Ward 4, we've gone we've gone through hell trying to implement a lot of these issues um, and there's a great deal of resistance, there's no doubt. Uh, but the same rate, uh, it was well worth it. And it, it's not perfect. So I know a lot of people complain about some of the measures. Nothing is perfect. But if you evaluate data uh, prior to and post, I can assure you, we're better off. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, safety being the priority. I think that's a, that's an absolutely clear statement, I think. Uh, I've got Councillor Pearson, first time. Go ahead, Councillor. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, and I appreciate all the uh, conversation around the table. Um, I don't have as big an issue with some of the downtown core and the more um, compact areas in the city as being Ward 8 and Ward 14, etc. But I do want to just remind um, committee that we also are in the midst of the truck transportation uh, review and the truck route review. So I think that's going to factor in as well as far as moving forward for safe streets and just being sure that that's also kept on the radar because that's in a process right now. <clears throat> just wanted to put that down. Thank you. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. No further speakers on the uh, report as a whole. So we're going to go back to the Public Works. Councillor Danko moved it. It was seconded by, refresh my memory, Councillor Danko. Councillor Marula, thank you. All those in favor of the Public Works Committee report, please indicate. Do we need any thumbs up votes? Everyone's able to vote. Councillor Marula, not yet. Thumbs up, sir. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Apologies. All in, that's carried unanimously. Thank you all very much. Rise from the Committee of the Whole. Councillor Johnson may have a motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole, please. By myself. Yes, you may. It is moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Farr that Committee of the Whole rise and report. Thank you. All in favor or opposed? Votes are still coming in, and that was unanimous as well. Thank you. We're going to turn now to motions. Municipal bylaw to prohibit off-road vehicles on highways within the city of Hamilton. Councillor Clark, your motion, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Brenda Johnson. Um, whereas there has been an increase in, of off-road vehicles, specifically ATVs on municipal highways, creating safety issues for the community, Whereas, the, whereas there has been an increase of off-road vehicles driving on private property resulting in property damage, whereas Bill 107, Getting Ontario Moving Act, Transportation Statute Law Amendment 2019, made amendments to the Highway Traffic Act respecting road safety and other matters, whereas one of the amendments of the Highway Traffic Act through Bill 107 allows municipalities to pass a bylaw to prohibit the operation of off-road vehicles on highways within the municipality. Therefore, be it resolved that licensing and bylaw services and legal staff be directed to draft a municipal bylaw to prohibit off-road vehicles on highways within the city of Hamilton and have staff explore the option of a prohibition of off-road vehicles driving on private property without permission. And I'll speak to it very uh, briefly. I know Councillor Johnson is going to speak to it. Um, I inherited the, the rural component of Ward 9, uh, which used to be in Councillor Johnson's um, uh, bailiwick. And what I have learned from that um, adoption of that rural area is that the ATVs um, are ripping up and down the regional highways, the side streets on the shoulders of the road, on the road itself, um, and they're have been a number of uh, very scary near misses and a few accidents caused 
On top of that, the vehicles are causing damage to private property. We most recently had a situation in the Red Hill Valley where ATVs were ripping around the ATV, the Red Hill Valley and damaged one of the observation areas. And of course the city is, has to, 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 to pay for the restoration costs. So this is happening on an ongoing basis in the rural areas of the city. I know it's not a big issue in the urban area, um, but there is a real risk that uh, these ATVs, when they're flying down the side of the road and, and no one expects them to be on the shoulder of the road, uh, someone's going to be backing out or pulling into their driveway and there's going to be a um, casualty. So um, I'd like staff to, to come back with a bylaw that we can review and, and contemplate. And I'd like them to consider whether or not there is any way we can can regulate the use of ATVs on private property where they're they're um, quite literally trespassing on farmers' land and just tearing up the cornfields like the movies, and and they seem to really like to do that. Uh, so I'll be happy to answer any questions from my colleagues, and I hope that I have your support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a speakers list of Councillor Johnson's, Marula, Jackson, and Partridge. Councillor Johnson, you're first. Yep, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Councillor Clark, for bringing this forward. Um, just to give people some history, in 2015, I had a very contentious community meeting with over 75 farmers and the police. Their livelihoods are literally being destroyed, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have ATVs that are going into irrigation ponds. Um, and not only ATVs, we have also snowmobiles, skidoos that are also trespassing. And people look at a field, they think that it's just a free for all and away they go. So as a result of that meeting, the Hamilton Police Services actually applied for and received a grant um, to get fully serviced ATVs along with their training. The first time they ever came out to Glenbrook, they um, were able to apprehend a gentleman on a dirt bike. And at the end of the day, there were 16 charges laid. So in, during that summer, we worked on a brochure and we had the police there, believe it or not, the ATV club president from Haldeman was in there, the conservation authority who also deal with hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage on their own lands as well. And we came up with a, with a brochure that had all the legalities in it and also some safety tips. But the one thing we wanted to drive home was that the ATV driver must have the property owner's permission, written permission, or they will be trust with, or, um, charged with trespassing. So again, thank you very much, um, Councillor Clark, for bringing this forward. I was not aware of Bill 107 and in 2019, obviously this has been quite recent. I would also just like to add a caveat to the end though, that the staff look at, um, uh, the farmers also um, know under the agricultural rules that uh, eight, their ATV is allowed to go from farm to farm as long as it's a husbandry to that farming operation. So I really want to make sure that we put that as a friendly amendment in there so that they're, um, they're also included. Um, and like I said, the farmers are pulling their hair out. Um, the swales that they put in their farms to allow for drainage to maximize their, their crop volumes are getting destroyed because uh, ATVs think that this is just a fun little hill to go up and down and they destroy the swale itself. And everybody knows what a swale's purpose is. And when it's been wiped out, it it totally floods out the, the fields and the surrounding properties. So thank you very much, Councillor Clark, and I am proud to, to second this. Okay, now, I, I did hear friendly amendments. So are you uh, gonna work on some language that uh, you can put on the table that we can assess? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a few questions. Um, I'm interested in this uh, subject because it is actually an issue in the city as well. Um, Globe Park and the Mohawk Sports Complex in Councillor Jackson's area is frequently uh, being abused with uh, ATVs. And if you go out at night walking your dogs, it can get very dangerous because um, uh, they just can't see you and they're traveling at, at very high speeds. Um, so I'm wondering through you to staff, there's, there's an already an existing bylaw in place for public property and every time I've called for enforcement we the, the police are referring it to bylaw they're, they're not responding and and by the time I get a hold of bylaw they're gone um, so the damage is done so I'm just wondering from from the public um, property perspective how many times have we actually enforced the bylaw successfully okay I don't know if uh, Ken Leander is on the call 
or somebody can yeah from somebody from biology i know it's Jason. kind of an unfair question but uh, yep. I, can we get that can we get that offline for you and i'm just wondering if they can give give me some sort of understanding of the present bylaw on public property right um and can they just elaborate on that okay jason yep. thorne yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I think the council, most, most of what the council referring to would have been uh, charges under the trespass to, to the parks uh, bylaw. Um, so I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I can certainly ask staff to see if they can they can pull the number of uh, uh, charges over the past couple of years, and we can share that with you. Sure. Okay, the other question is, it doesn't seem, from my perspective anyway, to be working uh, in the public, for public lands. And from a farm perspective, it, it would be private. I'm not... So I'm just wondering, I'm trying to wrap my mind around, if it's not working with the existing bylaw with our public lands, how is this going to work with the private lands when, when there's already trespass uh, laws in place, firstly? And secondly, wouldn't that type of behavior cross over to criminal when they're destroying crops that have value? Can anyone answer that question? Okay. Oh, Jason, I still see you there. Uh, Nicole Audi might uh, want to jump in on that point as well. Jason Thorne? Yes, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I can speak to the first part of that, and Nicole might have to speak to the uh, aspect of any sort of criminality. Um, typically, we report back to council on a new bylaw such as this. We would be including a uh, an enforcement strategy, um, as well as any uh, cost implications of, of an enforcement strategy. Um, so that would be part of our report back with the bylaw. Um, and then we do come to council every approximately year or so uh, with our uh, prioritization of enforcement of city bylaws, and that's where we can seek council direction as well if you wish us to reprioritize how we're enforcing certain bylaws. So um, we'll be able to parse, answer part of those questions when we have the report back with the bylaw. So could I then respectfully request that public lands be incorporated in this initiative as a friendly amendment? Would you accept that to you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Clark? Councilor Clark, yep, thumbs All up good. from Councilor uh, Clark. All right, thank okay. you. And then if we can have the data with respect to what the status of that bylaw is and how successful it's actually been, would be helpful as well. Okay, again, uh, if you could put some words to that that we can include as a friendly for the benefit oh, of the I, I, I think uh, I, just the public uh, parks be incorporated in the in the program itself. Included, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Clerks, have okay. you got that? Okay, we'll work on that. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And I'm supportive of what Councillor Clark and Councillor Johnson desperately uh, need for greater safety. So I heard Councillor Clark say this is not necessarily going to impact the urban area. And my only question through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Clark is that if it may, as Councillor Marula just touched upon, the last thing I want is these ATVs that normally would use shoulder or the road not being suddenly in an urban area forced through this potential bylaw to use city sidewalks where pedestrians, families are walking safely. Mr. Mayor, just through, I just need that reassurance, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, who can feel that one? Jason Thorne still there? Yes, yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I might have to defer to Councillor Clark as the move of the motion, but I, but I didn't read the motion to be restricted only to the rural area. I did note that Councillor Clark, I think, quite rightly noted that oh. most of the issues tend to be in the rural area. Um, but um, and and if I if I'm incorrect, then then Councillor Clark can can, uh, can can direct us. But um, I I took the bylaw to be a citywide. It's just that the anticipation oh. is that most of the issues have been in the in the rural area. Well, thank you, General Manager Thorne, because again, and maybe I'm just, this is a real stretch, Mr. Mayor, on my part, because I want to be supportive, especially if the outlying areas are experiencing these issues and damage and unsafe conditions. But in my East Mountain community, the last thing I want is taking somebody from a park setting and then they suddenly go, oh, I can't use the road. I can't use the trails on the in the escarpment area. Okay, I'll use the city sidewalks then and we're now bumping people, normal pedestrians that are walking safely on the sidewalk, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I take your point. Um, how would you like that addressed? So I'm just putting that on the record for now because okay. I take it this bylaw is still going to come back to us, Mr. Mayor. Correct. And uh, I will be monitoring that closely because the last thing I want is to solve one issue, but create a maybe even bigger one in the urban right. area for pedestrians. Thank okay. you. I will remind you, though, that Councillor Marula, you know, suggested a friendly amendment to include, you know, public public spaces. So that uh, might might help address some of the concerns that you might have. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Partridge. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to see this this motion forward. And, and I do appreciate as well, um, uh, Councillor Marula, putting in the, uh, the public property or the public um, areas. It, it is a huge issue um, throughout Flamborough, but uh, I'm gonna speak particularly to Ward 15. The big issue that we have is with the ATVs and uh, the dirt bikes. Uh, they're traveling on, on, the, uh, on the regular streets. So I'm, I'm just have a, a bit of a concern where it says to prohibit off-road vehicles on highways within the city of Hamilton, because I think it should be on, on all streets, um, you know, it, within the city of, of Hamilton. The issue here uh, for us is that uh, we have ATVs and dirt bikes and they seem to move in groups of five or six. And they're going through all the new subdivisions. And of course, all the subdivisions in Waterdown are backing on to farmland or green space. And uh, lovely, the new subdivisions have incorporated trails into them. And these lovely trails connect through the woods and connect to the other subdivisions. And uh, many people are walking in these areas, but so are the ATVs going in there and the, um, and the dirt bikes. We have had, as residents, uh, we call the police regularly. By the time the police come out there, uh, in, in many cases, they're gone, but they have been proactive. And I want to thank police very much. Division 3 has been fantastic. But the challenge is that the funding they received after that uh, meeting up in, in Glanbrook, Bidbrook area, and thank you, Councillor Johnson, the money that the police received to get the off-road, uh, the ATVs, they only have two officers that are actually trained to ride those ATVs. So they also have many other duties within the, within the city. So our challenge has been, um, you know, sending these officers, getting the two of them on their, on their uh, regularly scheduled um, times to be available to go out there and to go through the woods and go on these trails and I'm not talking about hiking trails. I'm talking about, you know, taxpayer funded trails that have been paved or uh, they have gravel on them. And like I say, they, they connect all the surveys together. So it is a real problem. Um, the police have followed some of these uh, folks, these, these young people to their homes. Uh, we've had residents who have videotaped them. And then as a consequence to the videotaping, because they've been weeks and weeks on end, um, going up and down the roadways, uh, these ATVs have then gone on to their property, chewed up their front lawns, torn up their garden beds, and away they go. So it is a big problem in Waterdown. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to see this come forward. But my understanding is dirt bikes and, and ATVs, they shouldn't be riding on any public roads. They shouldn't be riding on sidewalks. And, and they certainly shouldn't be riding in our parks. And I'm wondering if someone on staff could just answer that question because I heard, um, you know, what Councillor Jackson said about uh, these ATV riders coming off of our parks and going on to sidewalks. So can someone answer that question? Because my understanding was they were not allowed to, uh, to be anywhere on our public property. Thank you. Jason Thorne. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I think as Councillor Marula raised earlier, there is the issue of, of uh, trespass under, under the parks bylaw. Uh, so, so in some cases, what's being described would be a violation there. Um, my understanding is that uh, you know the Highway Traffic Act has restricted off-road vehicles in many of these locations in the past. What's different now is the municipal authority to actually um, regulate through a municipal bylaw as opposed to only under the Highway Traffic Act, which could only be enforced by police. Um, so I think that's one of the, the key changes here, which which now puts some authority within uh, within council's hands that didn't exist before. Thank and, and thank you, Jason. I do appreciate that. I have to tell you, though, when we have called bylaw, bylaw refer us to the police. They say the police are the only ones, you know, that can really um, uh, issue any tickets for for uh, vehicles, uh, motorized vehicles. The only word I do have a little bit of an issue with is off off-road vehicles on highways. If that can be changed to uh, all, all streets or you know something, something that's more encompassing, and if staff can take everything that's been said by all the councillors as direction to incorporate into the review, um, but I'm very happy to see this. Thank you very much, and thank you, Councillor Clark and Councillor Johnson. 
Okay, thank you. And I, I did uh, hear a friendly amendment that uh, it would include all public spaces uh, from Councillor Marula. So that should address uh, your concern, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Clark, you're up. Okay, just uh, give me one second. I just want to grab the. Um, so the rewording of the uh, the resolution that I have now, and perhaps the clerks can um, provide it to us on the screen if that's possible. I'll read it slowly though. That licensing and bylaw services and legal staff be directed to draft a municipal bylaw to prohibit off-road vehicles on highways and in public parks. Uh, which is to Council Marula's friendly amendment within the city of Hamilton, uh, including the exemption for husbandry use for normal farming operations and public parks and have staff explore. Oops, I got and public parks in there twice. That's my well, fault. They'll, not the, they'll adjust that's my fault. Not, that's yeah. my fault, not the clerks. <laughs> yeah. And have staff explore the option of a prohibition of off-road vehicles driving on private property without permission. Yep. And I think Councillor uh, Marula has suggested that instead of it saying parks, uh, Madam Clerk, that it say public lands. Right. And to Councillor Partridge's uh, question about highways, I use the term highways because that's how roads are described under the Highway Traffic Act. They're all called highways. Um, and in, in the meantime, folks, we will get a bylaw back and then we'll be able to parse it to make sure that it works for us and we'll go from there. I thank you all for your support. Okay, thank you. So I think the, uh, the amendments are pretty clear on the uh, resolution. Uh, so let's go to a vote. All in favor? I saw general support for the direction here. And we will get a bylaw back that uh, we can then mm -hmm. amend or adjust if, as required. Votes coming up in a second. There, there is a short second. Thank you. So it's my intention to get the uh, public portion of the uh, agenda done before we go in camera. We'll take a break at that point and then go in camera thereafter. So um, just be mindful of that. It's now 10 to 12. And I think the vote was complete and that was unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item 7-2, motion regarding the Federation of Canadian Municipalities election to the Board of Directors. Um, Councillor Jackson, you have a motion. Mr. Mayor, I do, and I need to uh, wait, wait the, rules. the rules, please, in yep. order to introduce it, please. Thank you. And it's seconded by Councillor. Yes, seconded by Councillor Jason Farr. Timely because it's a, a required for an appointment to the FCM board. So thank you. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Yep, Jeanette's uh, apologizing. Her computer is Jeanette, the computer. <clears throat> computer. These computers sometimes. Thank you for that. And back to you, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself. Oh, sorry. Okay, we need a thumbs up from Councillor Pauls. I don't see her on the call. Real is there. Thumbs up from Sam. Yep, thank you. Not there, yep. Okay. All votes are in, thank you. Councilor Jackson, go ahead. Am I still on, Mr. Mayor? You are. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, it is with supreme gusto that I move this motion, seconded by Ward 2 Councilor Jason Farr, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Election to Board of Dire Directors, whereas the Federation of FCM represents the interests of municipalities on policy and program matters that fall within federal jurisdiction. And whereas the FCM's board of directors is comprised of elected municipal officials from all regions and sizes of communities to form a broad base of support and provide FCM with the prestige required to carry the municipal message to our federal partners, therefore be resolved A, Council of the City of Hamilton endorsed Councillor Judy, and that's with an I, Mr. Mayor, Judy Partridge, to stand for election on the FCM's board of directors for the remainder of this term of council, 
B, that counsel assumes all the costs associated when Counselor Judy Partridge is attending FCM's conferences and board of director meetings be charged to our general legislative account. And Mr. Mayor, I just wanna say sincerely, I hope on behalf of all of us that both pre-COVID and especially during the COVID time, we've, we have not had two better advocates this term of council than your office, Mr. Mayor, and Ward 15 Councillor Judy Partridge, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Farr. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, motions on the floor, Councillor Partridge. Yes, very quickly, um, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. And I do appreciate that enthusiastic presentation of the motion. Um, and I just want to say that um, I want to assure my colleagues, we, you know, FCM has done a tremendous amount of work um, over the last few years. Uh, we now have a new CEO. Um, her name is Carol Saab. The uh, former CEO, Brock Carlson, has uh, retired. And um, there's four committees that I work on. And, um, you know, the, it, it's really wonderful to see all the different municipalities across Canada. There's uh, 82 members on the board and uh, altogether about 120 that work on the board and the committees of which I'm, I'm very honored and proud to represent Hamilton, um, you know, in that, with that group. And it's interesting to see that some of the issues that uh, municipalities have, they're very similar right across the country. Um, you know, some of them are to varying degrees, uh, obviously, but um, it, it really, it's really, um, I think, quite a, a good opportunity to be able to hear from other municipalities, share our ideas, and, uh, and bring those back to our respective councils, which I've been happy to do for you folks, um, letting you know different information and, and uh, uh, amendments that have gone through. So I thank you very much, and I do hope everyone will support my effort. Okay, so with supreme gusto, let's <laughs> vote on appointing Councillor Judai Partridge to the FCM board for the balance of this term. going to be a close vote. <laughs> Attention is mounting. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm having issues as well with my uh, voting, so thumbs up. Okay, oh. thumbs up. Anyone else need to do thumbs up? Can you see me? I'm here. Councillor Pauls, you're, we can't see you. Your video, there, there you are now. Thumbs up. Yes. Thank it you. Anyone else? Okay, we're all in. Thank you. Carried unanimous. Supreme gusto, which I'm, I'm not sure how, how gusto becomes supreme, but uh, I'll take that as a sign of enthusiasm. Thank you for that. Item 7.3, the proactive community information and solutions regarding Metrolink's demolition on King Street East. Again, a motion by Councillor Nan. You need to waive the rules. That's Personally, great. as a result, it's a Metrolink's issue that's happening as we speak. Moved by yourself, seconded by? Councillor Marula. Thank you. Any comments or questions? If not, Approval to waive the rules, please vote. Thank you. Anyone oh. need to do a thumbs up that's not able to vote? Councilor Marula, thumbs up. Councilor Pauls, thumbs up. Thank you. Councilor <sighs> Farr, not there at the moment. Councilor Johnson, also not there. Thank you, that's carried. And Councilor Nett, please. Thank you, through the mayor. I'm hoping to find a seconder with supreme gusto, gusto uh, for this motion as well. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by, thank you, Councilor Pauls, I saw your hand come up. Uh, the motion is before you and I thank my colleagues for waiving the rules. Uh, whereas Metrolinx has announced their intention to demolish 21 vacant properties in Ward 3 for expressed safety concerns. Whereas the duration of boarded up and vacant buildings have had a negative impact on the sense of community safety, pride and belonging. And whereas residents have indicated that they would prefer to see the vacant properties considered for proactive community enhancing solutions such as placemaking and art, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has made more urgent the pressing uh, housing crisis Hamilton faces, increasing the need for safe and deeply affordable housing. Therefore, be it resolved that the city manager and chief building official request of Metrolinx to prepare a community information plan that includes proactive communication from Metrolinx with adjacent neighbours to mitigate concerns of but not limited to noise, dust, structural impacts, pest management, and to 
explore interim placemaking solutions for any property slated for demolition, and B, that the city manager and chief building official request Metrolinks to provide a dedicated contact, including phone and email, for residents to connect with directly in regards to the demolitions, as well as related safety concerns on Metrolinx properties, and see that the city manager and director of housing be directed to connect with Metrolinx to discuss the potential of using the Metrolinx owned properties for affordable housing. The motion is before you. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Councilor Clark. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, su I'll support the motion. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're not providing faint hope to folks on item C, it says that the city manager and director of housing be directed to connect with Metrolinx to discuss the potential of using Metrolinx owned properties for affordable housing. The challenge is that Metrolinx core business is not affordable housing, so they don't have that authority. So it's likely they're just going to continue to say no, they're 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 not interested in that. So um, I don't want to faint hope up there. It's worth trying, but it's going to be a challenge getting Metrolinx to agree. If the minister agrees, that's a different story. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Uh, I would I would have a similar concern, but I think it's uh, worth worthy of us to ask. Mm -hmm. So, Councilor Marula, just on that point, uh, I beg to differ. I think that it's important that we first we identify that if if the LRT isn't going to happen. We need a secondary plan. Those parcels of land are incredibly valued, not only in monetary of value, but also for us to provide an opportunity for an increase of units in affordable housing. This is a really good motion and one I strongly recommend because it starts a discussion and it also provides us with an opportunity to put a framework together if, if it doesn't occur. I hope it, that's not the case. But if it is the case, we need to talk, we need to start the plan now rather than later, and, th and this motion will do that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I too uh, will support the motion. Although I I, I caution, similar to Councillor Clark, that um, you know Metrolinx does not answer to the City of Hamilton or to any municipality, and um, uh, so there you know certainly we can. Uh, we can ask staff to reach out and to have the conversations, but I, I really don't want folks out in the community to think that this is something that uh, you know could happen, can happen, or will happen. There's uh, there's a lot of folks that live uh, you know in those in those homes or have been displaced from those homes, which are now going to be torn down. That um, you know has been devastating to them, and it has it has uh, altered their life in, in a in a way that most of us can't even imagine. And and my heart goes out to them because I feel very I feel very badly for this entire situation. Which, you know, if the LRT is cancelled, it's absolutely going to be needless. However, I also agree with Councillor Marula. This presents an opportunity for discussions around using that land for affordable housing, and, and perhaps a way to work in partnership, uh, not only with the city but with the federal government and the provincial government to um, to actually come up with a plan for affordable housing because lord knows we need it it is long past due and we need to um, we need to get those conversations going quickly not only with metrolinx but with others as well so i i do support the motion and uh, i thank you very much for your time great thank you i see no further speakers on the motion so all in favor please indicate Councillor, yeah, I think so for the moment. Any thumbs up required? Nope, all in, all votes. Thank you, that was unanimous for those that are present. Thank you, Councillor Nan. We are now gonna go to statement by So I'll start with uh, Councillor Wilson. Anything else you wanna to add today? No, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Councillor. I know he's not there, Councillor Nan. Uh, my apologies. Um, statements by members. Um, yes. 
Thank you. So I just wanted to inform residents in Ward 3 that uh, via the, the votes that we just did in relation to uh, planning committee, there has been concerns expressed in the neighborhood, particularly in the Sherman neighborhood, around a building that has been uh, subject to a fire over almost two years ago, uh, that by ratifying the votes that took place around the planning committee motions, um, the city will be permitting a demolition permit for that site. So I I know that there's been tons of expressed concern from a safety perspective, the adjacent neighbors, uh, the fact that it's a walkway to, for children to get to Adelaide Hoodless Elementary School, uh, just notification to uh, residents in Ward 3 that the demo permit has, as of today, been ratified, and uh, we shall see some action finally on that property. Um, also wanted to send my condolences to the Tony Perry family and everybody in the community in Ward 3 who is um, currently grieving the loss of a community leader and advocate for young people in our community. I know that he touched the lives of many individuals and really supported certain uh, specific people towards a path towards life that um, wouldn't have been possible without his guidance and mentorship. So I just wanted to continue my extension of con condolences to the community and the family and also to our uh, council colleagues who worked more directly with him over the years. And also wanted to share condolences with the community with the shocking and devastating news that was released last week in terms of the remains of Holly Clark being discovered and wanted to acknowledge that there are many residents, not only in Ward 3, but across the city who showed up to um, you know, rotate into shifts while looking for Holly Clark at the time of her disappearance. And uh, I know that many people in the community were impacted. Again, if anybody needs some support in the grieving process, um, there's been a lot that we've all been contending with in 2020. Uh, the loss of loved ones and the loss of community members is part of that. And uh, so if folks need some support, uh, there are um, links on our social media platforms as well as available through my office to help support people who are dealing with the grieving process. I uh, just wanted to say thank you and also a reminder that uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m. we are conducting our second ribbon cutting uh, in COVID times. This one is for the very first wheelchair swing uh, in the city of Hamilton at Gage Park. We are going to have a safely distanced ribbon cutting. Again, folks, this isn't a general open call to anybody to show up. This is really to give those advocates in the community who uh, put the motion forward, uh, Rebecca Shea's work in terms of fundraising initially for the work to support those who uh, rely on wheelchairs in their daily life to have an uh, equitable, safe place to play. Uh, it is an opportunity to celebrate that community and their participation in this win. So uh, if you are interested, please do email my office at ward3 at hamilton.ca. Uh, there will be a strict protocol in place for those who are uh, present at the day on Saturday at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, for the rest of you, I encourage you to join us virtually for that ribbon cutting and celebration. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, briefly, with respect to the coyote issue in town, it seems that uh, over the years, uh, they've been spotted at King's Forest, um, Mount Albion. Um, but now I'm getting calls and I'm personally seeing them. Um, my, my daughter saw one by the stadium uh, recently. I've had calls about coyotes near Ballard School. There seems uh, to be that they're encroaching a great deal in the uh, within the city limits. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff, um, whoever would like to answer this, are we looking at identifying or assessing if the problem is greater today than it has been? If so, uh, what kind of plan can we pursue? And how can we mitigate um, what can be, I think, uh, dangerous in the sense that for, for smaller pets and smaller children, not so much for uh, for others, but uh, there is a direct correlation between safety of smaller pets and children and these coyotes. So if someone can elaborate on that, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so bylaw, Jason Thorne. Yes, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I haven't heard whether or not we're getting increased numbers of, of calls or complaints. That's something I can certainly look into to see if that's been up in, uh, in, in recent weeks and months. Uh, we do refer those uh, those calls to the ministry where there's uh, issues pertaining to to wildlife um, that fall, does fall within their jurisdiction. But I can certainly check and see if we're seeing increased incidents of uh, uh, of those sorts of calls, and uh, we can follow up with the ministry accordingly. 
Excellent. And I, I know that uh, last year, believe it or not, and uh, I thought I was seeing things, but it looked like a cougar I saw at uh, Mohawk Sports Complex. I contacted the uh, staff. They they visited the area because I was riding my bike nearby, went up to them, and they did some surveillance. But I don't think they've actually pinpointed uh, whether or not... Uh, whether or not they've captured this particular uh, animal, but it, it was a it was a pretty significant in size animal. Do you have any update on that? Because I know there was some media uh, on the issue, but I haven't heard anything since. Jason Thorne. So through you, Mr. Mayor. No, I apologize. I don't. Uh, but I can I can get an update for the councillor offline. Okay. Um, and lastly, with respect to uh, Tony Perry, I uh, just wanted to extend condolences uh, uh, to his family. Tony and I would meet. Uh, quarterly um, at Bedrock Bistro for, for lunch and, and discuss Ward 4 issues. He was the trustee for Ward 3 and 4. Um, he, he was a gentleman. Um, he he was he was kind of a renaissance man in many ways. He was a restaurateur when I knew him back in the day when he had Perry's in the West End of Hamilton. Uh, he then went into teacher's college, became a teacher and retired. Uh, he then became a trustee. He was an actor, as uh, Councilor White had uh, mentioned. But uh, he truly was a, a, a very interesting uh, a very altruistic individual who's going to be greatly missed. And I just want to send uh, condolences to his family uh, and his friends. And I appreciate your time. And thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, to take this opportunity. I know a couple of weeks ago, I raised the whole issue of the mobility mats that were, were going to be installed on the beach, and they've subsequently come in. And I wanted to thank again uh, Brian Carey and Kara Parks, sorry, Kara Bunn from Parks, uh, um, for their assistance with the Campbell family who made the request through to city staff within a couple of months from the time of the request that came in, obviously during very difficult times and busy times for our staff. Uh, they had met with the supplier, installed the mats, and they're now in operation today. So I just wanted to, to say again, thanks to staff for their proactive uh, assistance with the Campbell family and for making that project a reality. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you. Councillor Jackson. Am I on? Okay, yes, thank, are, yes, thank, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two things. I also want to offer my uh, sympathy, prayers, and condolences to the uh, Perry family, uh, Tony's widow, Claudette, and his children, uh, Bianca and Marco. Um, this was such shocking news this past Friday evening. Councillor Whitehead was, um, I guess, one of the first to find out, and he was kind enough to share this very tragic news. Tony, to my knowledge, was only 70 years of age, and it happened very, very suddenly at home. And um, as has been, the accolades that have been poured upon him are also richly deserved. Um, one of the best DJs in town at many, many, many weddings and functions and dinner dances, teacher, businessman, and successful separate school trustee as well, and and a trustee in a very challenging area of our city within the Ward 3, Ward 4 areas, um, and always helping young people to um, grow to be um, champions in life and and otherwise. And um, so it, uh, I'm still in a state of shock, uh, Mr. Mayor, because um, he truly was jovial, cordial, and, um, and a life of the party. And um, I'm, I'm still recovering over the uh, news that um, was given to me last Friday night. And, and as Councillor Whitehead said this evening from four to eight, uh, one evening only viewing, respectful viewing at um, Frescalante's and tomorrow 11 a.m. Christchurch Cathedral for the uh, church service. Of course, as much as possible, all safe distancing. On a happier note, Mr. Mayor, uh, I know uh, near and dear to your heart, you and I, uh, you've encouraged me, and I've been working on with my Albion Falls Stairway Task Force since Council was supportive um, in 2017 of uh, extending and building the extra fencing and structures to prevent people from um, injuring themselves, and in a few cases, sadly, the fatalities they caused uh, just by unfortunate, uh, in my humble opinion, careless behavior at Albion Falls uh, to the point where we had about 25 to 30 rope rescues before the additional fencing was installed in 2017. And with the additional enforcement through the great work of uh, manager um, Sorello, uh, Monica Sorello, um, I just wanna say that 
but through that adversity and through some of those very um, serious situations, I struck an Albion Falls task force made up of city staff and stakeholders involved with trails in the community and everyday citizens. We've been working by and large since this term of council resumed. And uh, Mr. Mayor, this fall, over the next few months now, we just had a meeting virtually uh, a few days ago. And so the public is going to see some conceptual plans on the city's show page, the website. There'll be direct letters of communication to my Albion Falls neighborhood of about 100 homes that are directly adjacent. And Mr. Mayor, it's exciting potentially that you're gonna see in the designs through the consultant and the great work of staff, a proposed platform stairway that will start at the top of Mountain Brow Boulevard and kind of like the um, gorge at uh, Niagara Falls, it will platform stairway, platform stairway, make itself over to a cantilever that will be right in front of Albion Falls, exciting in terms of safe access for uh, future visitors and the increased popularity of Albion Falls. But over the next few months, the public is going to be able to view and provide comments at this stage of the task force's work. I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great work, uh, thank you. I, I always believe that uh, providing accessibility there is one, one mission, even though we wanna make sure that people don't uh, do uh, silly things in that location, uh, that uh, safety is a primary concern, but access, uh, you know, nice to hear that, uh, that that's being worked on. So congratulations, well done. Uh, Councillor Paul. Councillor, oh, yay. Well, hang on, we're gonna unmute you here. Well, let's, let's, okay, here we go. All right, thank you, Mayor. I just wanna follow up with Councillor uh, Nan was mentioning about the accessible set, uh, swing set that Rebecca Shea has worked tirelessly to make it happen. I wanna thank her publicly because she is working with me as well. And we are uh, glad to announce that we will be putting one as well on uh, Inch Park. So I'm looking forward to working with Rebecca. I met her many times and she's a wonderful, wonderful cheerleader for that. So I just wanna say thank you publicly. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Councilor Danko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just like to welcome all of the Ward 8 students and students across Hamilton back to school this week in the age of pandemic. Um, leading up to it, parents were extremely anxious as were the students themselves about what this school year was gonna look like. I think our, our public health department at the city of Hamilton has done just a, a fantastic job getting those 19 dedicated public health nurses hired and trained. Uh, all our city Hamilton testing centers and all uh, the contract tracing work that they will be doing is going to be instrumental for this, uh, this school year moving forward. Um, I'd like to thank all the educators in the classroom as well. Um, you know, my kids went back to school this week and they've had uh, what might be surprising, it was kind of surprising to me anyway, that uh, they've had a very, very positive experience so far. So I think all the educators in the classroom deserve, um, you know, a real pat on the back for that, as do all the staff at our, our public school boards, the, the Catholic board and the public school board for, you know, working tirelessly through August to get their plans in place despite the, um, issues with the ministry. Um, and then finally, uh, I'd like to thank our, our city Hamilton staff, our HSR staff for getting the, the school extra, extras on the road. Um, not easy considering, um, you know, social dist physical distancing and, and all the COVID protocols that are in place. Our, our mobility plan, all our crossing guards that are out throughout the city. Um, and down to parking and uh, police enforcement at pick up and drop off, um, you know, with all concerns about how all these students are getting to school, when and where, um, parking and pick up and drop off is always a, kind of an ongoing issue. Um, but uh, it, it's been a really positive experience so far in the back to school. And uh, I think everybody involved uh, deserves a, you know, real congratulations so far. And I think we're all cautious, cautiously, optimistic, uh, you know, as we move forward. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Councillor Clark. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, they're not really good news announcements, but they're important to the community. Uh, so the Valley Park Recreation Center and Library, as you know, that's uh, going uh, ongoing expanded renovations. The improvements include upgrades to the mechanical, the roof, envelope, and the parking lot. Construction began in March of 2020, but it was shut down because of COVID-19. We were able to get the work back up and running for as of May 2020, and it's ongoing. The expected completion date is still the fall of 2021. Um, and I know I've heard some from some of the neighbors up there that about the, the noise, uh, the noise of the construction uh, will continue until they actually close in the building and start working on the inside. Um, I want to thank the Heritage Community Trust again for investing 1.5 million in the library for the common rooms. That's a, 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 a significant help to us. The Valley Skate Park um, is the wheeled sport facility that was destined for Valley Park. We've gathered the feedback from the community uh, on the different uh, types of park and, and we finalized the detailed designs. Uh, originally, the construction was supposed to begin this fall. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 and a few other impacts, construction has been moved out to February of 2021. And it is hoped that the skate park will be open for use by September of 2021. Uh, you can get more uh, information on the city website. Uh, Mud Street resurfacing again, it was supposed to uh, begin the summer of 2020 and we had announced that to the community. Uh, the project is now expected to proceed in 2021 after we establish some improved and cost effective alternatives to the construction. Um, it would save us a, a fair bit of money. So the decision was made to to forego it and do it uh, next year. So it will be tendered in late 2020 with construction in 2021 and the completion date uh, will reduce, the, the completion of this project will reduce maintenance costs and extend the life of the pavement and the bridge infrastructure, uh, which was a significant component of this uh, um, uh, RFP. And finally, the uh, Klein Park redevelopment, uh, it was set to proceed. Uh, we had had numerous meetings with the residents. Uh, there was going to be upgrades and additions, including new playground equipment, uh, new asphalt paving, paveway, pathway, um, paved parking lot for the first time with universal accessibility, a new sun shelter, a new drinking fountain, and of course, lots of landscaping. It was scheduled to start in 2020 and be completed in 2020. We're, we're gonna break soon. Oops. However, due to delays resulting from COVID-19, the project timeline has been pushed back. We're expecting it to be up and open for summer of 2021. Um, and finally, announcement to folks as the, the we come into the fall, Mr. Mayor, and we're going to have lots of colorful leaves along the escarpment face. I want to remind people that the Devil's Punch Bowl area has special parking enforcement along First Road East. Uh, Ridge Road between New Mountain Road and Centennial Parkway. It's a $250 fine for parking on the shoulders of the road. So please use the designated conservation area parking and enjoy the colors without the additional costs. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Mayor. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Pearson. Can't quite hear you just yet. Yep. Let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, on, on. Okay. Here we go. We got Is you. that better? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, dealing with computer glitches today, I think all around because like tells me I'm I'm open and then you're saying I'm not, but that's okay. Um, so a couple things, Mr. Mayor, and I'm sure everybody's been getting the complaints and and issues. I think one of the major, the biggest complaints I've received all summer has been speeding traffic, and just putting it out to the residents, especially now that the police are enforcing. Um, traffic and speeding issues and running, passing school buses with flashing lights, just cautioning and warning people, please slow down. I, I don't know what else we can do in the neighborhoods. I have 40 kilometer zones, speeding's not being uh, followed. These are technically school zones, the three that we all each got three in all of the wards. Um, you know, we had been hopeful that this would solve some of the issues, but I'm still, if I had to say the, the largest vial I have this summer is speeding. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
um, and, and reiterate to, to residents as I tell them, they're generally your neighbors. They're not strangers coming into the community or into your neighborhood. They are your neighbors that are speeding. So for what it's worth, I'd like to put that out there. I'm really pleased, Mr. Mayor, I think everybody over the years who ever had had to deal with Electra Horizon to get upgraded services in their ward, you know, it's like pulling teeth, but I'm, I'm pleased that I have um, a major uh, replacement of a distribution system in my ward. Uh, it covers pretty well an area from Green Road to almost Gray's Road, east of number eight highway and Barton Street. Um, it, it will entail the, re the removal of the underground boxes, which have been problems over the years, the power boxes, and putting them above ground. So I'm really pleased it's about a six month project. The neighborhood has all been um, been canvassed by Horizon staff. Letters have been sent out, and uh, really thrilled to hear that the residents had no problem with the boxes coming above ground. So they're just pleased to get their services upgraded. Um, so that's great news. And lastly, I just want to mention that I just received confirmation that uh, Waterford Park off of the North Service Road, East of Fruitland Road. Has been um, has had hoarding put up, fencing, and the uh, the works are commencing for the new splash pad and upgrades to that area. So good news, um, you know, staff are doing their best and working forward, and I think we all appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just three announcements, um, just to let you know that this weekend would have been the uh, Bimbrook Fair. And as all our events in the city have been canceled, so has the Bimbrick Fair, first time in its 163rd year. Uh, but people can still experience the fair virtually. So go to my website and you'll get all the information. Uh, the war plane is open to the visitors with safe practicing in place. Please wear your masks and don't forget to visit the 447 wing on your way home for some great food and company. Smile cookies are here. The Bimbrick Tim Hortons have a friendly competition with the Dunville um, Tim Hortons, and last year they sold $26,142.25. They came third overall of Canada, uh, and that was seven times more than the year before. Dunville did 42,000 uh, cookies, so the competition is on again. This is a friendly competition, and uh, just please support this cause no matter what Tim Hortons you are visiting because it does go straight to the camps and, it's, and, and local charities last year are... Our uh, Glenbrook Home Support were uh, community services were the recipient of the $26,000 and it was very much needed. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, I did my photo supporting the Smile Cookie uh, Drive yesterday with Leo Johnson and uh, hopefully people will uh, take out that 100% contribution. So for every cookie sold, 100% goes to the, uh, the special yep. group. So thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Ferguson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just had my cookie about half an hour ago. There you go. Arrived in the office here and they distribute them around. So um, I've got my sugar fix for the morning. Okay. Now, two things. First of all, the, um, as you know, Ancaster Fair came before council a couple of times, one about uh, sewer connection and development charges for a potential expansion. And uh, they had a membership meeting uh, on Saturday morning. Um, with reasonable crowd of the members come out and, and they voted to go ahead with the project. Um, it's a 75,000 square foot building. It's a show ring and, and cattle stalls and horse stalls. Um, if you look at Ancaster Fair, all the buildings together, most of you have been there, but if you take every building on that site now, it totals 90,000 square feet. And this is a 75,000 square foot addition of an additional building because there's such a demand for this type of facility. So it's a big uh, leap of faith that they're doing. It's about a $5 million investment. And uh, they should be getting underway this fall so they can get this all done while COVID's in place and they can't rent the fairgrounds anyway. And um, hopefully have it done by sometime late next year. Uh, secondly, the um, Hamilton Conservation Authority is opening their, their last two major falls this weekend. It includes the Dundas Peak, the Toos Falls and the Webster's Falls. And we're trying something new this year. We can't run the shuttle buses from Christie's because of their greens. Well, there's a Greensville congestion is why we ran the, the shuttle buses. They can't do them because of COVID-19. It'd be physically impossible to sanitize the bus because they would stop twice, once at Webster's and once at Two's in their loop and they take a load in each direction. And plus people just wouldn't be comfortable getting on buses. So we've gone to a brand new reservation system. 
and uh, it'll be the first time the conservation authority is using it, but it allows 50 cars to come into uh, the Dundas Peak in two falls per day. We There's four intervals. There's one at uh, nine, one at noon, one at three. Um, it, so they're staggered every 15 minutes to make sure there's no congestion back on the roads, uh, particularly um, the roads along through Greensville. And then there'll be an additional, let me just look this up, 20 cars that'll be permitted every um, three hours at uh, Webster's Falls. So um, you will not be able to get access without a reservation. You have to go online, um, make a reservation, find an open spot in the HCA website, pick a time when you wanna go and prepay. Uh, there's a fee for the uh, online reservation system. There's a fee for to get in and a fee for each person. It's not a lot of money, but uh, it has to be prepaid before they, they go in. So it's a way to keep social distancing and it's a way to not flood the Greensville area with um, a lot of cars that we have in the past, particularly now that we're not using the shuttle bus. So probably by the next council meeting, I'll be able to uh, let you know how the how the first two weekends go. We're, we're coming into the the time when it's the most um, attractive to go there because of the gorgeous views with the trees turning. So um, I think that's all I have for now, Mr. Mayor, Great. thank you. Yeah, I look forward to hearing that uh, nice experiment in how, how we can provide access, but uh, on a reservation basis. So it'll be interesting to hear how that plays out. Thank you for that. Good uh, creative thinking on their part as well to make it work. Uh, Councillor Vanderbeek. Good, can you hear me? Yes. Oh. I'm sorry, about the, I'm sorry about the earlier votes. I, I was trying to sort out my 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 uh, microphone. Anyway, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have anything to say because Councillor Ferguson just said it all. <laughs> As chair of conservation, absolutely. All right, all right. Anyway, okay. better here than me. Full, full support for the reservation service. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just have a couple of things. Um, with the reservation system at Webster's Falls and Two Falls, uh, and I will attest that Halton Conservation has been doing this for a while and it, it does work and they are very insistent. And if you show up late for your reservation within a certain time period, you lose your reservation uh, and you absolutely cannot get in. But my concern here is that when they can't get into Two and they can't get into Webster, um, they then are going to come over to Grindstone. And this past uh, there were more than 40 tickets issued. It, it is, uh, has been an issue for the last couple of years. I want to thank staff very much. Uh, we do have that, um, you know, escalated amount of $250 a ticket. And I just want to tell everybody that if you're going to go to Grindstone Falls, uh, it's a very, very tiny parking lot. And if that parking lot's full, please move on. Go somewhere else because you will get a ticket. And uh, you know we have to be we have to be very very mindful of the number of people. I also want to touch in the farmer markets that are happening. Uh, Drummond House, which is on the uh, Drummond Farms, I should say, which is on the fifth concession, just off Highway Six, uh, heading heading uh, east, is uh, having a farmers market. They have it every Saturday morning, and it's from nine until one o'clock. Conan's, uh, there's the farmers market taking place in Conan's parking lot which is on Robson Road off Parkside Drive, and it is from uh, eight or nine till one o'clock. And, and also Rockton Fairgrounds. Rockton Fairgrounds, you know, as, as has been previously mentioned, all fairgrounds have been struggling, but they have resurrected a farmer's market, which they are running on Thursday nights, or sorry, Thursdays from three until 8 p.m. So I encourage everyone to practice their safe uh, social distancing Please go out and support our farmers. The last thing I want to touch on is we did have a, an incident. Of course, this is the time of year when people do like to go out and do the pick your own. And we did have an incident this past weekend where one of the pick your own farms was overwhelmed with over 300 to 400 people coming to, um, to um, you know, pick some of their farm delights. And so there were charges because people did call and complain. If you are a farmer and you do have a pick your own, many of them have been following the guidelines and have been very, very good about only letting so many people in at a time. But 
If you don't do that, chances are there will be complaints and you will be charged. And people, if you're going out to the country, the weather is beautiful, the colors are going to change. But if you drive into a pick your own and you see 400 cars in the parking lot, you've got to really decide whether or not this is good social practicing and safe distancing of whether or not to go in. Face masks are required. Please be careful out there. Enjoy the country. We all love going out to the country, but please be mindful. This is still a COVID time and we, meet, we need to keep everybody safe. And if you keep yourself safe, you're going to keep everybody else safe. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good points. Thank you so much. Uh, we do want to encourage people to enjoy their community, but to do it safely. So thanks. Yes. Thanks for those good points. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just for clarification, uh, I had a resident that probably knew in Ward 14 asked me how I know about the impacts of um, Aberdeen. Uh, and I think Councillor Ferguson has stated in regards to what he's hearing in his own ward. Uh, I can tell you, Mr. Mayor, when I certainly was a representative for Ward 8, uh, we did a uh, uh, significant consultation in the Buchanan neighborhood, primarily in scenic uh, drive area. And uh, we had overwhelmingly uh, people showing up in the hundreds uh, and polls were done uh, and lots of communication, uh, uh, letters um, and even email uh, polls. And they all came out the same thing that overwhelmingly there was not support for the Aberdeen uh, change. And there is impact. So I want to make it clear to this new person uh, that it wasn't like there wasn't any um, input that would uh, gravitate to my office. Second piece, Mr. Mayor, is um, that we are, uh, because of uh, post-COVID, uh, our office is trying to find the best uh, way to communicate to the residents that respects the current environment that we're in. Uh, we have put advertisements out in the Mountain News. Uh, we have put out email blasts to the, the current network we have. We're getting abundance of supply of um, uh, suggestions and how we can best accommodate uh, direct communication with our communities. And we're also going to be putting out a letter to every household, again, providing that survey so we can best meet the needs of our community in response to their, uh, their concerns. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, um, I think it's important you sent out something this morning about decorum, and I think I, I recognize that, but uh, th this could be a subjective thing. And what seems to be uh, becoming more and more apparent, if you disagree with someone, uh, then automatically they see it as disrespectful. And I want to be clear. Um, we under understand, and it's clear to us, who the activist is in our community and who are not. They all belong to our community, and they all have a right to speak. But I would suggest that activists are seasoned, uh, and as uh, seasoned individuals, will be probably uh, challenged a little more to uh, the degree in the and asking asking questions. And when you ask questions, Mr. Mayor, and there's uh, uh, inconsistencies in the answer, you're going to uh, expose that. And when you do that, that's not disrespectful. And this is where we need to understand where the the, the, the concern is, because to challenge an individual in regards to a presentation that may be inconsistent is not a disrespectful approach. It's part of democracy, and it's part of flushing out the truth. And truth is what we need to hear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I just want to highlight that. Thank you. Councilor Farr? Thank you. Can't quite hear you because your microphone is not... Uh... Yeah, there you go. Thank there you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I just wanted to wish a very happy 85th anniversary to our good friends at the Goodwill Amity Group. And I'm sorry if someone else has already mentioned this, maybe even yourself uh, during this round, this meeting. Um, they have that iconic head office, of course, at 225 King Street, uh, King William Street in Ward 2. And I've been in and out of there for many, many years, even in my uh, life before uh, politics. And they're great people here on Hamilton Mountain. Oakville, Burlington, uh, their mission is changing lives and strengthening communities through the power of work. And they've been putting a lot of people to work and giving them confidence since the 30s, mid 30s. So happy 85th. Uh, last year alone, I'll leave you with this stat, 853 people employed through their programs and they supported another 3,063. Uh, their resale and uh, recycling operation keeps 3.1 million pounds of goods out of landfills. And during uh, uh, our pandemic, unfortunately, they did get some City of Hamilton funding. And with that, they provided over 4,000 meals to date. They continue um, uh, for those in our community experiencing food insecurity. They're great folks doing great things. And they're a big part of your 
Economic Task Force too, Mr. Mayor, and I know they proudly sit at that table. So happy 85th, Amity Goodwill. Uh, they do indeed, and thank you for doing that. Uh, you know, it's been a long-standing organization that's done great things in our community. So we, uh, it's worthy of celebrating their long history here and what they're going to continue to do in the future, which uh, I think is always the mission going forward. Uh, for me, I just want to thank uh, the community at large for continuing to do the good work they're doing relative to COVID. As someone's pointed out, we're not post COVID. We're still very much in the middle of it. And we need to continue to be mindful of the, the, the physical distancing and the hand washing and the masking, all those things that are important. And we already see in Toronto and in Brampton and Ottawa, a spike in the numbers so far, not in Hamilton, but um, you know, could very well happen here if we relax our resolve too much. And so, uh, you know, given that uh, things are opening up a little bit more and given that kids are going back to school and given that, uh, you know, the potential for community spread is still very, very much there. I just want to thank everyone for, for doing the things that they have been doing and remind them to keep doing them. This is not a time to relax. This is not a time to let go of that notion that we're, we're out of the woods now and everything is, is good. Uh, it, it can turn very, very quickly. And uh, in the moment that starts to become a hospitalization problem, we're right back into the potential of shutdowns or closures, uh, all the things that we don't want to have happen. So keep doing the good work out there, members in the community, and keep uh, reminding members of council, your constituents, that uh, this is very much a COVID era. We're not out of it by any stretch. Uh, and until such time as a available vaccine arrives, uh, we're still going to be having to do some of the things that we're doing today. Someone asked me the other day um, in a grocery store, you know, how long do you think we're going to require masks? And, uh, you know, my answer to them was, uh, you know, plan on 2021. Uh, this, this could be with us for a while. And even if a vaccine is available at some point, in early 2021 or mid 2021 that may not be universally available or you know for everyone uh, to the degree that uh, it prevents us from or allows us to relax things uh, significantly so i think we need to accept that this is a kind of a new reality that is going to be with us for a while and uh, please keep doing what you're doing in the broader community thank you all very much and i'm going to ask now that we move into closed session and before we do that we will take a break so we will move into closed session and then uh, recess or not move into closed session sorry oh yes thank you again another reminder closed session minutes uh, of August the 21st. Any any issues, concerns? So on closed session minutes, yes? Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the uh, closed session minutes of the 21st? Moved by Pearson and second by Partridge. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, that's an electronic vote. Mr. Farr, thumbs up. Councillor Collins, Councillor Whitehead, thumbs up. Thank you. You want to speak to the closed session minutes? Okay, well, I'll come back to you in a second. Okay, that's carried. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to go into camera. Can I, should I? Just recess our meeting now and move into camera when we come back. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so we'll uh, we'll recess for uh, half an hour, to going to quarter after one. Councillor Whitehead, I saw you again. So, did you want to speak to a particular issue? Do you want to identify that, please? Mr. Mayor, I have a, an issue in regards to a committee of adjustment decision. Uh, that I'd be reminded just now in an email uh, that I need to appeal. Uh, uh, to the council in regards to uh, its, its decision. So we'll, can we uh, deal with that at the end of the, uh, the, the meeting as opposed to now so I can get more detail? Uh, this, we are going to come out of camera at some point. So if you want to prepare something when we thank come you. out of camera, we could uh, we could certainly entertain it then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So a motion to uh, recess for a half an hour, so quarter after one. 
Moved by Clark, seconded by Vanderbeek. Show of hands would be appropriate. All in favor? Carried, thank you. We'll see you in a half an hour. Have a good lunch. Have a good break.
Okay, we are back and we are live. And we are gonna take a motion to move into camera. Pursuant to a closed session, section 81, subsection E and F of the city's procedural bylaw 18270 as amended and section 2392, subsection E and F of the Ontario Municipal Act, as amended as the subject matter pertains to a litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. Members of the public are advised that the meeting will continue following the closed session portion of the meeting when you see the members of council rejoining the meeting. Council will wait up to five minutes upon re reconvening an open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media time to prepare to return. So on the motion to move into camera, it's moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, thumbs up from Councillor Farr. Anyone else? Councillor Nan, thumbs up. Uh, I think I did. Well, I'll do it again. Came up twice. Councillor Farr had thumbs up. Councillor Nan had thumbs up. Who else? Okay, thank you. Perfect. And that's carried. So, Madam Clerk, would you make the to go into camera with gusto, supreme gusto, if we could? Gusto supreme.